which is yeah, for sure. Those are my favorites. Um, I could not find Qbert. That was the only one I did. This is the oldest school I went. Does anybody have this one? Oh, you have died of dysentery, of course. Yes. <laughs> I do still play Frogger, but only on actual city streets. That's funny. <laughs> Going back to my Atari. <sighs> I, I, my favorite thing about Zoom meetings is the background. It's the only fun part, really. Well, I mean, you guys are great. But I mean, only fun part. <laughs> but you're better in real life. here can you hear me i hear you I'm trying to see you can you see me i I'm can using, i'm using a different computer so i just want to make sure this one works i see you now okay i believe that we are good to go i guess shall we welcome everyone to the Boulder City Council meeting of Tuesday, May 26. Pam, can you call the roll? Do we have Pam here? I guess. I no, actually, have. Debbie Stamp is going to be the clerk tonight. Okay, very good. Debbie, would you like to call the roll? Absolutely. Council Member Brockett? Present. Friend? Here. Joseph? Present. Nagel. Here. Swetlick. Here. Wallach. Here. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. Great. Thank you very much. And I guess I will check in with Sarah. Sarah, did you want to go over the ground rules at all for the meeting on Zoom? Sure, I'd be happy to do so. Good evening, Council. This is Sarah Huntley. I'm the engagement manager. We actually have no open comment or public participation this evening, but uh, for consistency's sake, it's probably a good idea to go over our rules. For council members, you'll be able to use your raise hand functionality to indicate to the mayor that you wish to speak. He should be able to see that for each one of you. We do have some folks on the line who are listening, but members of the public are watching via the link tonight. We do have the RAB chair on the line listening just in case the council has any questions when you get to that agenda item. So I just thought I would point that out for you. I'll quickly call up the rules this evening. Bear with me for one moment. So as always, we're trying to strike a, strike a balance between transparent, meaningful engagement and online security. So the meeting's been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere are prohibited. We're going to have uh, time limits for speaking, although as I mentioned, we have no public comment or no open comment this evening. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. And no video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited presenters. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. We'll be using the chat function tonight for panelists to communicate with each other. We do have the Q&A turned on if attendees have technical questions only for the moderator, that's me this evening. So if you have questions about the platform um, on how to view people, I can certainly assist with that, but we're not get going to be doing any substantive commentary about the issues in the Q&A box. And only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen um, during this meeting tonight. I think that's pretty much all I had to cover. Um, Mayor, I turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And I will just note that I'm using a new headset tonight. So if you're having trouble hearing me or whatever, I can always go back to the old one. Just somebody let me know in the chat box or whatever. You sound um, great, Sam. Okay, super. Thank you, Aaron. So I guess um, the next order of business is to um, solicit a motion to amend the agenda. So there are four items that we would potentially add or reorganize um, as far as order for the agenda. That's item 3A, which is a CARES grant for the Boulder Municipal Airport. Item 3B, which is an update around the city response for reopening restaurants. 
uh, item 3C, which is an update on the 30th Street transition as far as um, severe weather sheltering and operations of the COVID Recovery Center. And then there's item 4C, which is a motion to amend council rules of procedure regarding declarations. Um, so if anyone would like to make a motion to amend the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, so I've got Bob as the motion, Rachel as the second. Are there any objections to amending the agenda? Seeing none, uh, that's a unanimous vote in order to approve the amended agenda. And I believe that next we want to move to uh, a declaration in honor of everyone who's graduating this year who has had a change in their planned graduation to something new. And to present that declaration tonight, we have um, Junie Joseph. Junie, you're up. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor to present this uh, declaration celebrating the 2020 high school graduation class in the city of Boulder, May 27, 2020. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2020 graduating classes of Arapahoe Ridge High School, Boulder High School, Boulder Prep Charter, Boulder Universal, Fairview High School, New Vista High School, September School, and Watershed School are not able to participate in the traditional style commencement ceremonies at their respective schools. This council wishes to congratulate all graduating seniors with a permanent memorial of their accomplishments. The graduating seniors have endured many struggles that have not stopped them from continuing on their path to graduation. The graduating seniors have adequately passed each grade level leading up to their final year in high school. The COVID-19 pandemic will not stop the 2020 graduating class from achieving the honor of graduation that should be bestowed upon all graduating seniors. The COVID-19 pandemic will not prevent the 2020 graduating class from going forth into the world to fulfill their dreams. The city council of the city of Boulder, Colorado congratulates the graduating seniors from Arapahoe Ridge High School, Boulder High School, New Vista High School, Watershed School, Boulder Universal, Fairview High School, Boulder Prep Charter School, September School. This will be a day in history and the graduating class of 2020 will never be forgotten and shall always be honored. Very good. Thank you, Junie. And now I believe there's a short video from all of council that we'd like to present to the community. Hello, I'm Sam Weaver, Mayor of Boulder. Our Boulder City Council members wanted to take a minute and congratulate the entire graduating class of 2020. It is an honor to congratulate all my fellow buffs who graduated from the various CU Boulder colleges and schools in the spring of 2020. As a city council person and a current CU Law student, you have inspired me to keep pushing forward during these challenging times. Thank you for staying the course and leading the way for the next generation of graduates. Special congratulations to all those who are the first in the families to graduate, and to those graduating from other colleges, including Bowlers and Europa, our many outstanding area community colleges, and to those graduating traditional and other programs. Congratulations on y'all's huge accomplishment. We hope you've all enjoyed your years here in our beloved city. We appreciate all that you've added to our community while you were here. And to all who have helped the graduates to succeed, the teachers, family members, coaches, advisors, we congratulate you on a job well done too. Not many generations have been tested as you are. We admire your grace in rising to meet the challenges of these extraordinary times. We honor your resilience. And we have faith that you will make our world a greener, safer, and less divisive place. We're having some well earned fun today. Let me close this video by joining my city council colleagues in congratulating each and every member of the class of 2020. Best of luck to you.
Very good. And I will say thank you to Juni and Rachel for helping organize the video uh, and to all council members who participated. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn back now to the city clerk and I think we're on to item two. Sam, can I say something? I'm sorry, go ahead, Mirabai. Um, I just wanted to include, um, I wasn't able to join in with the video, but I also wanted to include um, Tara High School and Shining Mountain Waldorf School, which were both left out. So just congratulations to all those seniors as well um, and to all the rest of the students who graduated. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mayor Bai. Okay, next on the, the agenda is your first call up. It's a landmark alteration certificate for 734 Maxwell Avenue. Great, does anyone have any um, urge to call that one up? Seeing none, the next one. The next one is a landmark alteration certificate for um, 956 16th Street. Very good. Anyone who would like to call that up? Seeing none, I think we're ready to move on to the next item. Um, matters from the city manager. The first item is to approve by resolution the Boulder Municipal Airport Federal CARES Act grant. Yes, thank you. Um, earlier today, Bill Cowran prepared a memo that was sent to you. Uh, we have received the a grant from the CARES Act of $30,000 to support the municipal airport operations. Um, in order for me to sign that agreement, I need a motion approving it from the city council. So we're hoping that you pass that motion quickly. Thank you. Great, so I turn now to council. Are there any questions on this issue? Comments or feedback? Uh, Mary? I just wanted to make a motion. Go for it. So I move that we approve the city manager's request for um, the Air Boulder Municipal Airport um, CARES grant um, to be accepted. Great, do we have a second? Second. Okay, very good. A motion and a second. Does anyone object to accepting this grant? Seeing no objections, that's a unanimous assent to pass the motion for you. Thank you, City Council. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the implementation of the city response to the needs of reopening restaurants. So let me just introduce to you um, one of our favorite presenters, Yvette Bowden, who will um, give a short presentation on this item. And following Yvette, Charles Farrow will be also making a presentation about um, reopening in general in the city and a webinar that he was able to participate in today. So Yvette, it's your turn. Great, thank you, Council, uh, and thanks, Jane. We're going to be um, turning off my video so that I can make sure my uh, reception is well. We can go to the next slide. Last week, Council gave some direction uh, to us uh, following our recommendation about the needs of restaurants in our community. Restaurants, like all retailers, are a very important segment of the community contributing to the economy and our local quality of life. As we told you in our timeline last week, um, we wanted to follow your direction. And so we have this update for you tonight to share how we've progressed against that timeline and your additional context you provided. On Friday, you received a memo from me outlining the additional information we received since your last council meeting. So some of this work reflects that input. And Charles will follow me this evening as we explore a little further the information we were able to share with the community earlier today. First, as we expected, uh, the governor did issue guidance on Monday uh, regarding opening opportunity for restaurants. This included extensive information on social distancing and other safety related efforts as they reopen. The governor also encouraged, as we all thought he would, outdoor expansion opportunities to be managed and handled by local municipalities. With your direction, we're a little bit ahead of the game. Here's what we've done so far. 
First, uh, earlier today, an emergency order from the city manager was posted, allowing us to move forward with some of the things that you asked us to waive and implement. The city has waived administrative fees, as you suggested, and um, eliminated or waived, I'm sorry, temporarily, the minimum parking requirement for retailers across the city. The online application and FAQ that Charles will talk about in a minute in a minute uh, will be live on the web page. If not now, then certainly maybe even by the end of this meeting, uh, allowing people to apply right now um, for those temporary modifications to their alcohol licensure and to use the right of way um, to expand and allow for social distancing and reopening restaurants. Earlier today, um, there were two webinars, one from the county that further explained the state's guidance and the county's support for that guidance, and the second one at 3.30 this afternoon that was for the restaurant industry hosted by the chamber outlining the online application process and FAQs that will be provided and discussed a little bit later in this presentation. We're also moving forward regarding a first phase of closures on West Pearl and the Event Street. Let me pause here. Um, when During your last council meeting, you gave us direction that we should be flexible and listen to businesses and trying to accommodate that wherever possible. Following your uh, the presentation, which also included a suggestion around closure of a portion of East Pearl and 13th Street on the Hill, we got some additional feedback, as did you, from the community members, uh, particular retailers that were concerned. We did not hear um, the same kind of feedback everywhere, so we are moving forward swiftly to close West Pearl and the Event Street, and I'll have a map for you in just one second. Of course, we are also planning to provide you with a thorough update on July 28th. Next slide. So um, the closure areas that we are moving forward with right away are Pearl between 9th and 11th, including a portion of the alley on 10th north of Pearl. And the reason for this is because otherwise um, 10th would dead end into Pearl and there'd be difficulties of turning vehicles. By allowing this alley access, we're also accommodating the many businesses that need to continue to receive deliveries and um, to provide for safety in that area. This uh, area is something that we're working on and have received feedback on from Downtown Boulder Partnership, and we continue to work with all of our partners. On the Hill, there was a lot of support expressed for Event Street closure, um, and so we'll be making that similar modification um, one half block west on Pennsylvania from 13th um, up until that alleyway there between 12th and 13th. This is infrastructure that was built for this kind of uh, flexible retrofitting, and so we'll be moving forward with that. And the Hill Boulder looks forward to continuing to listen to merchants on 13th Street who are not yet quite ready to go there and who wanted to have other options. So there, we anticipate some moving forward with parklets and other ideas. Earlier today, there was a lot of conversation about curbside and other retailers and how they can benefit from this. And staff will continue uh, to do just that. Listen to the work of our partners um, on the Alliance and to the work of our peers and navigating not only with the county, the safety precautions, but also with each other across departments. I, for one, want to thank all of my colleagues, including my, my following presenter here, Charles Farrell, for uh, all of their work, Michelle's team, Charles' team, and all of our colleagues that have been um, so instrumental in helping us get this far. Um, you will learn a little bit more uh, in the slides to come. We thought it prudent that Charles could fly through some of the slides that we presented earlier during the webinar um, and talk a little bit about the time frame and processing. And with that, I'll turn it over to Charles. Oh, one, one more slide, sorry, very quickly. So you remember the timeline. Um, I've highlighted in red here where we've kept to those dates or even beat those dates. Um, and so the application goes live later this evening or at the latest tomorrow morning and we start review. Take it away, Charles. Thanks so much, Yvette. Good evening, Council. I'm going to stay off camera because I'm struggling with bandwidth issues this evening myself, but um, I'm Charles Farrow. I'm the Development Review Manager for the City, and I'm also serving as uh, the City's Economic Recovery Coordinator for the time being. 
Chris, did you want to pull up my deck? There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be speaking with you this evening just briefly about our brand new temporary outdoor seating uh, area program for restaurants. You can advance the site, Chris. So we recognize how important restaurants are to our local economy as are all retailers and recognizing the rapidly evolving guidance from the state on restaurant reopenings, we wanted to be ready um, when the orders were given from the state and I'm happy to report that we are. Our application went live this evening at 5.30 p.m. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, uh, some of the standards that are going to be included. So as you know, we've had a staff team internally working very diligently um, on establishing a temporary program to allow for additional outdoor seating on public and private property to support restaurants during the COVID-19 crisis. Our intent has really been to create low cost options for restaurants with minimal requirements for additional outdoor seating that encourage social distancing and honor the most recent guidance provided by the state over the weekend. And finally, we wanted a simple streamlined Online, online permitting process with a detailed checklist and comprehensive FAQs. Um, we even made an instructional video that uh, went live this evening. Um, so just a few notes on eligibility. All licensed restaurants in all zones are eligible to use the city's right of way, including on street parking, sidewalks and alleys adjacent to your restaurants. The city has waived all minimum parking requirements as Yvette has mentioned. So privately owned parking areas and other privately owned spaces could be eligible as well. For the state's recent guidance, um, as of now, bars and other establishments that are not licensed retail food establishments with kitchens will be considered in June. And while this program doesn't directly impact food trucks, um, as we discussed with the council uh, over the past few weeks, they'll be able to operate in residential zones in addition to the industrial zones that they're allowed to operate in currently. But I do wanna be clear that food trucks still will be precluded from operating downtown and in mixed use and uh, other commercial areas. You can advance the slide, Chris. Um, as Ben mentioned, we waived all the fees. Um, the only fee that will be applicable at this point will be the state's liquor license modification fee, which they've reduced from $300 to $150. Our process is completely online. Um, we've created a simple application, a very detailed and prescriptive checklist, and a comprehensive set of uh, frequently asked questions. Um, as we've noted, the window for applications will begin um, now through June 30th, with the program concluding on September 30th. Um, with regard to review times, our reviews will take no longer than three days with inspections to occur very quickly uh, thereafter to ensure compliance. And applications for liquor license modifications will occur concurrently over that three-day period. But I wanna be very clear for our applicants. We are not asking you to wait for inspections or formal approvals. Your application you submit, you're gonna agree and acknowledge um, to comply with the standards, um, which again are very prescriptive. And then you can go ahead and start getting set up. An inspector will come out to ensure uh, compliance and issue a certification um, and we'll work with you in a socially distanced way to resolve any issues or questions you may have on site. So there isn't really a waiting period. You submit your application, you start moving. The only caveat to that is um, you won't be able to start serving alcohol until your modification has been uh, approved. So you can go ahead and advance the slide, Chris. So just a few notes on outdoor seating design and operation. The state's guidance that was issued over the weekend provides really detailed recommendations for things like table spacing, occupancy, communal seating. So we're asking our applicants to abide by those, um, by that guidance. And we've established some standards that are really designed to be flexible and encourage simple outdoor seating elements that don't require separate building permits, additional time or cost. And I really wanna emphasize that simplicity. So we're suggesting things like removable tables, chairs and umbrellas, the use of rugs and artificial turf, temporary barriers of all kinds that can be pallets, movable planters, temporary fencing railing. Um, applicants can have low wattage ornamental lighting and outdoor music and the city even has a program that'll connect you with local artists to make your temporary barriers um, engaging and beautiful. Um, outdoor seating areas would be able to operate until 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and then from uh, until 11 p.m. on Friday, Saturday and on federal holidays. Next slide, please. 
So there is a little bit of fine print. Um, the areas are used to be for sit down dining only, not for long games. We really wanna discourage kind of congregation. Um, we wanna encourage social distancing. Um, we don't want elaborate structures or decking in the right of way. Again, it will lead to subsequent requirements for permits, additional time and cost. Um, we're gonna ask applicants to not obstruct things like storm drain inlets, drain pans, valve boxes, manholes. Um, we don't want extension cords across the sidewalk or parking lots. Tents and canopies will be allowed, but there's some size limitations to be aware of. Um, there's obviously a requirement for proof of insurance. Um, and there'll be instances where we'll need permission from private property owners. And we're asking that fire hydrants um, aren't obstructed and that no outdoor grills, heaters, or candles are used. All of that is specified in detail in the application package and more particularly our checklist. Chris, if you wanna advance the slide. So just to highlight some of that simplicity, this is really what we're talking about. Very basic um, elements out in the city's right of way. You wanna advance one more time, Chris? Again, discouraging elaborate structures. This is really more of a cafe seating model, which I think would be successful. One more, Chris. And then the repurposing of public parking areas to allow for dining opportunities. One more. And there's a few more of those. And on the lower left-hand corner, um, you'll see some of the uh, mural work. Um, uh, the barriers there. So that concludes my uh, remarks tonight for the board and I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions you may have. Great, thank you, Charles. Um, Jane, anything else? Uh, no, I don't think so, thank you. Great, Yvette and Charles, I just wanted to say I, I attended part of the webinar this afternoon. I give you great kudos for how quickly you've moved on all of these issues <laughs> and also, I had no idea how detailed the questions you would face would be at the yes. early stage. So, um, Ms. John and Charles did a great job, and we're thankful to our partners for hosting. Thanks at the chamber. Good. So I, I thought it went well, and I think um, we're getting set up well for the opening on the 27th. So I've got two hands up, three hands. I've got Bob and Aaron and Mary. Bob. Well, let me first just by saying, wow, that was fantastic. Um, you delivered everything we asked for last week and then some. So you guys did a fantastic job in a really, really short period of time. So I want to thank everybody, particularly um, Yvette and Charles and Ms. Sean and I know transportation and fire and police and everybody was involved. It's just, just absolutely fantastic. Thank you for pulling that together so quickly. Um, I had just one question. Um, did you mention, uh, Charles, precisely when uh, the 9th to 11th Street and the Event Street um, would be actually closing? I didn't, but I would defer to either Yvette or Bill on that. I can cover that. Go for it, Bill. So um, we're actually going to purchase the barricades um, to cause these closures to occur so that we'll have them in perpetuity. Those barricades are gonna arrive on Friday and we'll have the whole street, um, both streets uh, shut down in time for Friday evening. That's perfect, thank you so much. Just a great, great presentation, great work by everybody. Thank you so much. Sam, you're muted, but can I go next? <laughs> Sorry, I've got Aaron and then Mary. Aaron, you're next, go ahead. Thanks, well, I'll just echo the enormous thanks and how uh, how detailed of a job you've done in such a short period of time is phenomenal. Um, so just one quick question. So it, uh, I think you've laid out the requirements in the right of way really well. And so if, um, if a restaurant owner who's interested in taking over like a plaza or a parking area in a privately owned parcel, um, are there similar requirements or, or is it just that they can kind of do whatever their landlord allows them to do? There are similar requirements. Again, we're recommending that um, everybody keep this really simple. At the end of the day on private property, the landlord will have to um, approve the work that's being done. And so would you kind of start with the landlord and then go to the city for a permit and then come back to the landlord to show that you got the approval? No, we actually have a form that's included in the packet that will be submitted. Um, so you get your uh, landlord to sign it and you include that with your package. Great, okay, can't wait to see these springing up. Thank you. Mary? 
So, first of all, I want to extend my gratitude for all the work that was done in such a short time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, I read somewhere, and I think it was in one of Yvette's emails that mentioned that there was, the city was moving forward with the planning and was um, opening up leasing for furniture or something like that. And I just wanted to um, find out more about that, if that had to do with um, helping out restaurant tours that may not have the capital to come up with the furniture. Um, so that's my first question. Hi, Mary. Um, so let me clarify. The materials that we were looking to lease are the barricades that Bill was referring to and the other closure materials, not uh, furnishings. We are unaware, and I've talked to my colleagues in a couple of other cities, including Denver. Um, we don't know the scale of this and cannot see a way to do it equitably. Um, but I know that our partners are looking into creating potentially lists of local providers where they can rent furnishings. Um, and, and I think that's a good first step. So I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to clarify. Thank you. Thank you, Yvette. And then um, my second question is um, in res with respect to the private um, parking lots that may be available for um, businesses in those areas. Can property owners extend a fee for to the restaurant owners for using their parking lot? So that's a great question and it is their property. Um, and so the relationship they have with their tenants would be um, their ability to do so. I would say that our partners um, on the Alliance have been really uh, great about outreach to local property owners and commercial property owners, and everybody wants uh, reopening businesses to be successful. We'll keep our ear to the ground and find out what we can, but it is certainly possible. Well, so I would just like to discourage that kind of, um, of behavior, I guess, and, um, and if, that property owners can just extend their parking lots at no charge to their um, renters, that would be, that would benefit them as well. And so I think um, anything that they can do to allow them to reopen without any extra burden on them would be very much appreciated. I know that our partners are listening, so I'm sure they'll convey that. Thank you. Sure. Great. And I don't see any more hands up. Let me double check. Nope, no more hands up. So I, I appreciate it, Sam. Um, if I could just conclude by thanking my stunning colleagues across the organization who worked busily all weekend um, to stand this up. Uh, amazing team effort between PNDS, transportation, community vitality, the attorney's office, support from the manager's office, and then of course all of our partner organizations in town, DBI, the chamber. Um, it's really been a fantastic effort and it's been an honor to be a part of it. Great. Well, thank you, Charles. Thanks to the entire staff team. Um, it's clear, I think, to all of us on council that you guys have burned the candle at both ends and gotten results really quickly. So looking forward to the restaurants being open and um, great work. And I think next week, maybe we'll want to check in again, see how it's going. Sounds thank good. You. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Okay, the next item on the agenda is an update on the 30th Street transition and the CRC operations. Good evening, Council. This is Kurt Fernhauer, Director of Housing and Human Services. And I'm going to give a, an update on, on two areas. Um, one is transitions with our COVID Recovery Center, and the other is transitions at 30th Street. Um, many of you have been asking questions um, about the, the various services to the homeless um, over the last couple months through this, this COVID process. Things have changed. Um, but uh, as we get to the end of May, when transitions normally occur, uh, I wanted to give an update on, on those two items. Uh, next slide. So the, um, this is just a, a look back at the last two months. Um, the COVID Recovery Center was uh, 
you know, the, on the 20th of March, it was a proactive step to try to prevent the spread of, uh, of COVID through the, the population, which uh, many have seen as, uh, as a vulnerable population. If we look at uh, the results of other communities, um, uh, they haven't had near the success that we've had of keeping the numbers down um, as a result of this. You'll see in the, um, in the, the chart on the left uh, is the number of individuals that were staying there um, each night. And then the orange is the um, number of individuals who were um, um, exited the CRC. Most individuals stay, stay there between seven, uh, five and 10 days and um, uh, can leave once they receive a health check from a, um, a clinician who does daily rounds there. You'll see a green mark, uh, a, a, a vertical uh, line. That's when we were able to start testing. Uh, we weren't able to test for the first uh, three weeks or so. Um, so the, the numbers of positives was most likely higher than this. Um, and um, uh, because we were screening people and continue to screen people every single day that goes into the go into the shelters, both in Boulder and Longmont, we're able to immediately pull individuals out of the system. Um, you'll see the errors. We've noticed a real shift in the last year or so. We've had significant contributions from CU students who are now um, uh, leaving our community and, and getting on to, to other things. Next slide. This is one of our volunteers uh, uh, working at the CRC. So one of the transitions we're making, we're, we're opening the uh, East Boulder Community Center for um, other expected purposes related to Parks and Rec uh, uh, beginning in later June. So we've been looking at a different location to hold the CRC. And our anticipation is, is that we may need a CRC type function going through this next winter season. So looking for um, a new location, we were looking for a place that could be open um, for some months to come. We're at relocating at Mount Calvary, uh, previously Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in South Boulder. It's now owned by Boulder Housing Partners who are through the entitlement process uh, create affordable housing there uh, starting in 2021. Um, we also looked at uh, hotel options um, and um, uh, we, we looked at other communities that had a lot of concerns um, how that actually turned out. Um, down in Denver, one of their uh, locations up to 25% of the uh, most individuals tested were were positive, and they've had um, over 200 individuals that have tested positive. Um, the costs are um, eligible for FEMA, and we have been um, structuring the financing of this um, with anticipation of, of being first um, by FEMA. And um, this is a um, a coordinated effort with the City of Longmont, City of Boulder, and the County. Slide. Let me get to the, uh, the, the transition of 30th Street. Uh, on the left there, you'll see the various services um, that occur within our homeless uh, uh, program currently. Severe weather shelter normally closes on at the end of May. It will be closing um, at the end of this month. Uh, like it normally would. What, what was really different in this spring is primarily it was open um, virtually, almost virtually every night um, since the middle of January. Uh, navigation services, there was an RFP that was put out um, several months ago for that. Um, and um, the Boulder Shelter uh, uh, won that RFP. They will be starting um, the, the, the navigation program starting on the 1st of June. Back when I presented it in January, there was concern by some council members about the capacity for the North Pole Shelter to house um, navigation center uh, services as well as the housing focused shelter. I'll 
in my next few slides, I'll go through um, what that looks like. How the Boca Shelter stays the way it is. Um, that's the primary program uh, at, at the North Boulder Shelter. Coordinated entry is, um, since uh, we've been under this COVID environment, has been uh, by, uh, by phone. And um, we're um, going to be moving that um, service to um, 909 Arapaho, which is the Age West um, Center on Arapaho and 9th Street, um, uh, probably about in August. Next slide. <laughs> so the, the transition um, over um, this next week and last week um, was really the two organizations working together, Bridge House and the, the shelter, um, to work specifically with clients that were uh, that are in the navigation program and um, having a smooth transition to a new location with, uh, with um, different staff. There's been communications um, at both organizations on our sites and um, signage as well. Next slide. So this is a look at navigation. Um, navigation um, hovered in average around 38 individuals um, at any one time for probably a couple of years. Um, in January, uh, that really started to go down. It continued to go down through this spring. Uh, we're now anywhere from um, five to 10 um, individuals that are that are currently in the navigation program. The, uh, the coordinated entry screening that occurs um, on a continuous basis since January, 7% of the individuals have been in, in the community for less than six months. It's hard to pinpoint all the reasons why the navigation census has dropped, but a couple key reasons uh, we think, and it's hard to attribute um, uh, to, to each of them um, in actual numbers. Our shelter remaining open every night. Um, you know that that shifted individuals from navigation um, to weather shelter. Uh, the first week that, that change was made in January, um, four individuals um, dropped out of navigation, and we've seen a reduction. But a lot of it also is is related to the change in residency criteria, which um, occurred in February. Next slide. So this is the um, this is what the, the, the Boulder Shelter looks like um, on the left side as far as um, number of individuals who are there. Uh, that's been on a, a downward trend um, over the last year, really a result of our, our focus on getting individuals housed. We've been able to house 122 individuals over the last 12 months, an average of 10 per month. Um, we've also worked real hard, particularly with Boulder County, in increasing um, the availability of vouchers, as well as the city voucher program as well that expanded in 2020. Um, some of the impacts of COVID, um, we, the, um, there was a reduction in um, the number of beds um, down to 90. Um, our census there over the last month has been 75 to 80. Uh, we met with public health last week um, and we made some suggestions that have that's got it up to 100 beds and there's a plan in place to um, look at continuing to increase that um, over the next few months as well. We also have been using a hotel where we are able to place um, individuals who we believe are vulnerable, um, um, both because of age and um, conditions. The, the capacity um, of, the, of the shelter for navigation um, we believe um, uh, will fit within the North Boulder shelter in combination with uh, how focus shelter. Uh, the reduction in beds does make it challenging. Um, as you can see, it, it, it looks like, you know, the numbers add up. Um, right now we'll be continuing to add beds and we also have flexibility uh, in, the, um, in the hotels. 
So we believe we've responded well to the challenges that COVID has put on the, on the home community and our services. And um, just wanted to answer um, that question that I know council had um, back in January and what it looked, what it looked like on, on the 1st of June. The next slide. So we've been working very diligently on continuing to get people housed. The first three or four weeks of COVID was uh, pretty frustrating. Everything was shut down. We were all trying to figure out how to get work done. Um, not too many people were getting housed. Um, but the, the, the housing exits team worked incredibly hard on trying to figure out how to get around a lot of those challenges. On the right side, all those bubbles are all the various voucher programs that that team has been working with. But you'll see MHP was also quite successful over the last four weeks, um, getting um, 20 people housed. Boulder Shelter got 23. We have eight people that are being processed currently. Um, move in at CCLO, which uh, they received their TCO um, on Friday of this last week. Uh, next slide. Um, this last slide really is a, is a thank you to Bridge House. Bridge House has um, been an incredible partner over the last couple of years, particularly around navigation and really um, inventing um, a program for our community on how to get individuals uh, um, housed into different directions. Um, these are on top of the housing exits that come from Boulder Shelter. And um, you'll see that the average length of a navigation process uh, with Bridge House has been 10 days. They've touched a number of, of individuals. Um, and um, along the bottom in the graph there, you can see month by month um, the impact um, that this program has had uh, in housing individuals in a number of different ways. Um, and so um, I think uh, Bridge House has been a great partner and we really appreciated that and really appreciate appreciate the way that they've worked with um, the Boulder Shelter in this um, transition over the last um, year or so. And um, we look forward to continuing this, this uh, legacy program that, that they um, um, really helped our community with. Um, and lastly, before I close, um, one thing I forgot to mention about the CRC uh, is that we, were on, we uh, CDC contacted us about two weeks ago and we a, a tour to the CRC. This weekend, they um, contacted us again. They're developing um, protocols, um, infection control procedures for congregate living um, uh, in, um, in shelter type um, settings um, similar to our CRC. And so we're um, testing and evaluating those, uh, those protocols um, against our experience. Uh, so that, that concludes my, my updates and I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Sam. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Kurt. That is an amazing update and it is um, very thorough. Um, just to uh, <clears throat> make sure council and the public knows, the intention of this um, update is simply so that we can see what's uh, changing as we go forward. It, through the summer, we will have another longer, deeper dive into the overall um, homeless sheltering initiatives that we have going on in July. And so please keep questions and or comments focused specifically on um, the changes that are coming at 30th Street. So I have some questions for you, Kurt. I have Aaron and Rachel and Mary. Aaron, you're up. Great, thanks so, so much for that update. And I wanna say how encouraging it is the number of housing successes that we've had, the numbers of folks who've been housed recently during these incredibly difficult conditions is, is truly amazing. So huge thanks to everyone involved with that in the city and in our partners. It's really impressive. My um, 
one question is, um, you know, so all the services are transitioning to the Boulder Shelter for the homeless here coming into June, and they do have a reduced bed count. I, I appreciate how um, you've worked with public health to increase that a little bit and also get some um, hotel beds. Um, that's another great move. One question is, is so one of the uh, functions of the Path to Home program was the navigation services, you know, which have, has done a lot of great work over the years. And part of that program is the ability uh, to have uh, some uh, services provided during the day, not um, a day shelter per se, but particular services for individuals that need them, case management and such. Um, is that going to be uh, continued at the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless site? Okay, so Aaron, I think I missed a couple of your words, but I think I got the gist of it. Um, so the the navigation services, um, um, uh, they meet with a um, an individual that helps them through the navigation process. And that happens during the day. Um, and those are, those are scheduled and they work together with that individual um, over a, a, a week or two period. Um, it's not open for daytime services, but those functions do occur during the day. It's also worth noting just for clarification that, um, you know, part of navigation is the individual um, taking steps as well through their navigation plan. So they will do things like, you know, visit social security or get connected with um, um, medical services or other um, benefits um, that will make them successful in their housing transition. You know, each person will have um, possibly different things that they will be working on um, during the day. So the, the navigation process is, is more than just um, meeting with um, 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 the, the staff member. The other thing in, in, um, that I forgot to mention in my presentation and your question prompted it, is that starting on June 1st, um, the Boulder Shelter will be um, um, opening their doors in the mornings for individuals um, who are not engaged in services um, to receive breakfast and showers. Um, and that's really a response we requested the shelter to look at this in response to the um, uh, the rec centers not being open right now, and we're a little bit unclear on that process of how they will open. Um, in past years, rec centers um, provided some of that service for individuals, and um, that service was provided at 30th Street um, up until now. Um, so that's an additional support that we're trying to put in place um, uh, during this transition time. Great, that's good to hear on both counts. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt and Aaron, um, Rachel, and then Mary. Rachel. Hey, thanks, Kurt, for that presentation. Um, great information as always, and um, how awesome that the CDC sought out the CRC for um, information. Congratulations on doing such a great job that you sounds like are a national model. So kudos to your team. Um, my question on, oh, and also I want to say thank you to Bridge House for the services that they provided all these years um, and are going to continue to provide in a different way. On the 30th Street, it was a little bit hard to follow some of the numbers because we, you know, we've thinned out some beds and then we added some beds and then we're putting people in hotels and we've got CRC um, and maybe Mount Calvary. So long-term, putting all the COVID stuff aside, I had been concerned um, you know, six months ago that we might have a reduction in overall bed capacity or numbers. Mm -hmm. How did that um, shake out when we didn't get another lease somewhere else, right? We're just moving everything to the homeless shelter. So I was just wondering what the long-term bed numbers look like. Yeah, that's, um, so I, I don't completely know the answer yet because we're still working on that with public health. In the conversation that we had last week, um, we, um, what we're trying to get to is probably closer to the 140 mark um, at the North Boulder Shelter. Um, hopefully we'll get there. Um, and with, um, if we can maintain um, some hotel coverage if needed for individuals um, who are at risk, 
you know, that gets us up to the um, original capacity of, um, of the North Boulder shelter. And um, um, so, the, I mean, the COVID recovery center, um, like you said, that's a little bit of an unknown. That could close in August, it could close in November, it could close next spring. Um, if it is open for that period of time um, through next season, that would have obviously add some capacity as well. But that really isn't the, the, the purpose of the, of the CRC. Great. Um, and then one other question. Obviously, we um, own the East Boulder Rec Center and um, BHP owns Mount Calvary. Would there be a, a fee associated with moving the, the CRC there? Um, no, there there will not be a fee for renting it. We'll um, likely cover some utility costs. Awesome. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Great. And then Mary? So thank you, Kurt. I want to echo um, the gratitude that Rachel expressed about um, your recognition with the CRC um, and um, also extend gratitude to Bridge House. So thank you and your team and Bridge House for everything you've done. Um, my question, you don't necessarily have to answer now and perhaps you can cover in July when we have our full study session on this. Um, the graph that you showed of um, the housing that's occurred, the ready to work engagement, the placement, uh, reunification, all of those successes are largely due or probably almost entirely due to the engagement um, with navigation services. So it's disconcerting to see that the engagement in navigation services is dropping. So um, as part of what you cover in July, I'd be re really interested in understanding what um, you might be able to do in order to help people re-engage with those navigation services. Absolutely. I'll, um, I'll say most of that for July. The other thing that I'll add, though, is we started in a new program um, the end, end of January that we hadn't done before called Diversion. So it's, um, it's really the step um, for individuals that um, aren't necessarily qualifying for Diversion. Um, and it's a, it's a much broader program that can support, um, you know, um, a much, you know, many individuals of different um, lengths of time in the city of Boulder. Um, so, um, but I think we share your concern that we want to um, um, ensure that the navigation the numbers are successful, first of all, um, but um, that, that, that that program continues. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mary. I've got Aaron again. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add my thanks to, to Bridge House for running the Path to Home program so successfully for the, the last however long it's been exactly. It's been a phenomenal program and they've been fantastic partners. And of course, they're still still at it with Ready to Work. So just wanted to echo those thanks um, for the amazing work they've done in our community and will continue to do. So great. I don't see anyone else, so I will go ahead and jump in. Um, first, I want to join my colleagues in thanking people. I think many have been um, touched on by uh, other council members. I want to say thank you to Boulder Housing Partners um, working with us on uh, the Mount Calvary church site to be able to relocate the CRC is great because it allows us to um, get East Boulder Rec Center ready to receive visitors but also preserve that function, which as others have noted, is a model that other communities are looking to. So thank you to BHP and to everyone that's been involved with both the CRC and our ongoing uh, homeless services um, journey. I had a couple questions that are quick answers and then some to think about for July. First question is, Kurt, could you tell us how many people will be housed at CEQLO and Canopy? Um, I don't have those numbers, but typically we're trying to um, house anywhere from 10 to 12 um, individuals out of our PSH or voucher program that are focused on homeless individuals. Um, there's, um, um, and, and BHP works with us across all of their properties. 
So these are really just the new properties that are coming on. Um, there's also um, other developments that are coming on at the same time, like, like bus stop and um, McKinsey Junction. And we're working with them to hopefully get, you know, some individuals in there um, as well. Okay, super. <clears throat> and then the more complicated questions that you don't need to answer now, but I'll just put it out there. It kind of follows along with what Mary said. Um, so we've seen a drop in folks who are navigation services. And to some extent, um, that's been attributed to severe weather shelter becoming open all the time. It seems to me like that conclusion is somewhat confounded by the residency requirement um, changing somewhere in the same ballpark of time, yeah. which said you have to have been in the county for at least six months in order to qualify. So when we come to July, I'd want to dig into how can we tell the difference between those two impacts and then the diversion program and how the diversion program fits in for those folks who haven't been here six months, but who are um, being treated in the sense that we're trying to help them find either reuniting or um, another option for housing. So anyway, when we get to July, I will be wanting to dig into the um, cause of the drop in navigation services. Yep, be glad to do that, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. So this is great. It teases up really well for our July conversation. Um, thanks to everyone who's been helping with this effort. And I'll turn it back over to Debbie. Your next item is the flood and storm water update. And so I'll introduce Joe Tadiucci, who will introduce his team to make this presentation. Joe. Thanks, Jane. Uh, good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is Joe Tadiucci, and I'm the city's utilities director. And we're here uh, tonight to talk about our flood and stormwater utility. And there are a few different reasons for tonight's discussion. The first is that we've typically done a study session on this utility every few years, and it's it's been a while. I think it might go back to 2013 or 14 since we've done one. And um, as you'll see in the presentation, there's a lot of process associated with this utility. And as you know, there's always a lot of public interest in the, in the projects that come along. Uh, next, we're starting an update of our flood and stormwater master plan. It's, it's been since 2004 since we've done a master plan, so we're due. And uh, you'll hear some about that in the presentation. And and there'll be an opportunity for city council to provide some input. The last uh, reason for tonight's discussion is uh, that we have on June 16th, uh, a public hearing coming up on the South Boulder Creek project. And we've been talking about different uh, levels of flood protection and funding. And so in our memo for this item, we had a table with, that showed some of the other projects in our six year CIP from last year. And so that'll give you a sense for some of the other needs across the city. And so for our presentation tonight, uh, we have some PowerPoint slides and uh, Douglas Sullivan is our principal engineer in utilities. And he, along with uh, Katie Knapp, who is a utilities uh, engineering project manager, and she's leading the master plan update. They'll both be running through some presentation slides. And then we also have uh, Ken Baird, who is our utilities finance manager, and he'll be here in case there are questions in that area. And also pleased to have Kirk Vincent, who is the chair of our Water Resources Advisory Board, joining us tonight. So I think we have about 15 or 20 minutes of prepared uh, materials. And so I will turn it over to Douglas Sullivan to get started. Great, thanks very much, Joe. Uh, good evening, City Council, I'm Douglas Sullivan, and I'll be taking the lead on this presentation with Katie Knapp. She's an engineering project manager in our flood and greenways group, and we'll be moving back and forth depending upon the components we're talking about. On the agenda here, we're gonna do a brief introduction, and then Katie's gonna cover a bunch of the flood risks and the, the major program components that drive a lot of what we do. I'm gonna speak about some of the projects that have been completed to date, high profile ones around the community. And then we will 
and talking about the flood needs going forward and what that means for the CIP. So I thought we'd start with a, a visual here uh, about the three utilities uh, components. Uh, for the most part, people are very familiar with both the water and the wastewater utilities. And I've got a couple of buzzwords here to sort of capture what are the critical elements of those. And when we think about water and wastewater, we think about health and safety specifically. And the reason we're drawing a contrast here is because the storm and flood management utility is so different for so many communities. Uh, on the water side, it's fundamentally about providing safe, clean drinking water that's reliable 24 seven. And then the wastewater utility, it can be summed up to separate you know water and wastewater and to ba basically collect and convey and treat that and meet standards that are put forth by you know CDPHE the storm and flood management utility was created in 1973 and this is important from a history standpoint because there was a significant flood in Denver in 1965 uh, and it is pretty much understood to be not only the most costly but also the most devastating in Denver's history and what followed that right away was the development of the urban drainage and flood control district when a number of engineers and community leaders got together and decided there need to be a greater focus on that so that was only four years after after the big flood. The Urban Drainage and Flood Control District continues to this day. They had their 50th anniversary last year and they renamed the district the Mile High Flood District. So if you're not as familiar with that, that is the group that we're talking about and we can speak to them later. So when we speak about the storm and flood utility specifically, we speak about life and safety. The presentation tonight is gonna focus primarily on the flood management program. I wanna mention a few things in the storm and flood utility because there's so many components here, but there's not really an opportunity in this length presentation to talk about all of these components, but we do have an opportunity for the council members to ask questions later for the ones we didn't cover. So when you think of the stormwater and flood management utility, you might think of storm drainage, stormwater quality. The major drainage way program is fundamentally what we're talking about tonight. There's a big component on emergency preparedness, <clears throat> education and outreach, and of course, regulations and development. So we will have a list of some of those topics later in the presentation to queue up questions specifically because we did not cover them. So I'm gonna hand this over to Katie now to start with the flood risks and some of the main components, and then I'll jump back in later to talk about projects. Yes, thank you. So my name is Katie Knapp and I am an engineer project manager with the city of Boulder. I have been with Boulder for 14 years now. Um, so I, I have a little bit of history with the city myself. Um, I'll get into some of the city's flood history, but first I'd like to talk a little bit about the risk. Um, Boulder has often been referred to as the number one flash flood risk in Colorado. Um, and this is due to the geographic location of the city. It is directly adjacent to the mountains, um, which are right to the west, as you can see in the picture in the slide. So rainfall in the mountains can quickly collect in the canyons and create a flash flood situation with very little uh, warning. All right, so um, one thing I would also like to point out, which is unique about Boulder, is that we have 16 major drainage ways with mapped floodplains, um, which you can see on this map. So it is impossible to cross the city in any direction without crossing multiple creeks. And so that really exasperates the, the risk that we have to the community. We have um, quite a history of of flooding. Um, so the, the list here shows some of the more significant flood events. The city's flood of record occurred back in 1894, where it was estimated that Boulder Creek reached 100 year flood levels. But uh, many of us remember the 2013 flood where several days of rainfall resulted in flooding along all of the major drainage ways. In 2013, the damages were widespread and they extended well outside of the 500 year floodplain. So the orange dots on this map show the locations 
uh, flood insurance claims and the 500 year flood plan is shown in light blue. So um, in addition to creek flooding, sanitary sewer backups and high groundwater contributed to the flood damages. And this map illustrates why we encourage everyone to purchase flood insurance even if um, they do not live in a designated floodplain area. So I'm now gonna give a brief overview of some of the elements of Boulder's flood management program. Um, we often consider flood management a cyclical process that starts with floodplain mapping to identify the highest risk areas. Mitigation planning then identifies measures to reduce risks and projects are implemented through a design and construction process. Following significant construction projects, floodplain maps are then updated to reflect the changes to the flood risk, and that completes the circle. So I'm going to briefly touch on each of these. So we have four main flood zones that are included in um, floodplain mapping studies. And each of these zones also has specific floodplain regulations. The high hazard zone is the area with the highest risk to life and property and also has the greatest development restrictions. The high hazard zone is a city designated flood zone. It is not a FEMA flood zone, unlike the other three zones. As you move down the list, the flood zones are generally less hazardous with fewer regulations. The 100 year flood plain or the 1% chance flood um, is the FEMA regulatory flood zone and drives flood insurance requirements. The 0.2 percent chance flood zone or the 500 year flood plain has requirements only for critical facilities such as fire stations, hospitals, schools, and daycare facilities. There are no restrictions on standard development in the 500 year flood plain, so basement construction is allowed. So floodplain maps are routinely updated to incorporate both advances in technology, such as improved floodplain modeling methods, but also to reflect changes to land use from development or flood mitigation projects. We currently are working on two floodplain mapping updates. Um, on the, uh, the left or west side of the map is Sunshine Canyon Creek, and that is a new study to update the current mapping, which dates back to 1987. And then the floodplain mapping for Wonderland Creek um, on the, the other dot on the map there is being updated to reflect improvements that were recently constructed between 28th Street and Foothills Parkway. So mitigation planning studies typically follow floodplain mapping efforts to develop some recommendations to help address the flooding risks. Public input is a very important part of mitigation planning and is really most valuable at this stage of the, um, the circle. So mitigation planning studies will typically include a robust public, public engagement process. During the mitigation planning stage, Different flood mitigation alternatives are evaluated using a variety of criteria. Um, we consider social, environmental, and economic factors with um, a few of them listed here on the screen. Final rec recommendations for flood mitigation are adopted into flood mitigation plans. And we have different mitigation plans for the different creeks. We are currently working on two different flood mitigation studies. The southern study is for Skunk Creek, Blue Bell Canyon Creek, and Kings Gulch. And the northern study is for the Two Mile Canyon Creek and Upper Goose Creek area. So um, flood mitigation projects are then implemented through design and construction. So I'm going to uh, turn the presentation back over to Douglas Sullivan to show some examples of major flood mitigation improvements. Great, thanks Katie. So the utilities department has been fortunate enough to be part of some really remarkable projects over the last 20 or 30 years. So for this presentation, we pulled together just five photos that have some before and after slides uh, for drainage ways that the council members may know quite well. So on your left, this is Goose Creek. Goose Creek is a drainage way with its headwaters up near uh, the old hospital at 9th and Alpine. Uh, and, it, and it eventually 
has a confluence out with Boulder Creek out near 55th, past the Municipal Services Center, you are looking at Folsom um, on the left side of your screen and what would be considered an incised channel, uh, which is about three or four feet wide by three or four feet uh, deep. And this particular project, this drainage way went through what was known as, is known as the Mapleton Mobile Home Park, which had 125 units. And I believe 90 of those were in the 100 year floodplain. So at this time when this project was constructed, it was one of the highest flood dangers in the entire city. So the city worked with uh, Thistle Community Housing and HHS to actually purchase the mobile home park at that time to be able to construct some of these uh, drainage way improvements and then sold the park back. So what you see on the right is the bike path and also uh, the, the improved drainage way. One of the things of note, we coordinate with transportation on these projects and the circle boulder by bicycle uh, the 360 came through this in June and we had a ribbon cutting with 400 cyclists that moved through at this particular project when this was completed one of the other interesting and very difficult aspects of major drainage ways is they often interface with irrigation ditches. So the picture on the left this is also Goose Creek and this is in the vicinity uh, back in the Mapleton Mobile Home Park, which is west of and behind the Chez Tui restaurant. The picture on the left shows Goose Creek, an incised channel that is actually discharging into the Boulder and White Rock Ditch. So this causes a couple problems. Uh, the floodwaters from uh, the creek itself inundate the ditch, which does not have the capacity further downstream and often causes flooding in a number of areas that's not prepared for it. So the picture on the right, what you see is an improved structure that is conveying the ditch water actually across Goose Creek and Goose Creek flows from left to right underneath that. And if you look at this particular structure, it has an overflow mechanism. So if the ditch was ever to overflow, it defaults into Goose Creek, which now has improved capacity to handle about 3000 cubic feet per second. So this was completed about 15 years ago. One more shot, just as a reminder of the Goose Creek of what you saw before, there was a parking lot for the mobile home park, which bifurcated the north and the south half. And so you can see behind the curb, the size of the drainage way and the vulnerability to large flows associated with it. The picture on the right is where the ribbon cutting actually took place. So two more photos moving forward. I mentioned the Chez Tui restaurant. Behind that is actually the confluence of what's called Elmer's Two Mile Creek and Goose Creek. Elmer's Two Mile Creek flows south and it is located between Folsom and 28th Street. It would come back behind what is now as the Rayback Collective. So the picture on your left was the unimproved channel this drainage way now has the capacity for an additional 800 CFS. It joins Goose Creek just west of 28th and then conveys safely under 28th for 100 year improvements all the way down to Boulder Creek. One last photo we pulled in as part of this presentation was the recently constructed Wonderland Creek improvements. This was a substantial project that ran about $20 million. It covers about a mile of drainage way. This is the upstream end, which is in the vicinity of 28th Street and the intersection of Palo Park to the east and Winding Trail to the west. The drainage way continues in an east-southeast direction all the way down to Foothills Parkway. This picture on the left shows a number of garden level apartments and homes and also what was uh, the former conduit and, and conveyance capacity under 28th Street. There was significant flooding and an emergency evacuation required in the 2013 flood associated with this. The picture on your right is an update. If you look very carefully in the back right hand corner, it's in the shadow, but we maintained the very culvert that conveys some of the flow. However, what you see with the two larger culverts now has the capacity to convey the 100 year flow safely under 28th and safely all the way down and under Foothills Parkway. Back to you, Katie. 
oh no, this is still mine, excuse me. Okay, uh, one or two more slides. We have a timeline here for the Wonderland Creek project. This shows about 15 years, which is a little longer than what would typically be associated with a single phase, but it speaks to the circle of the life and the key components that Katie spoke about before. The floodplain mapping was key. The mitigation plan is an alternatives analysis that has all the ideas. Once the alternatives analysis are identified, the SEEP, the city's community and environmental assessment process is a critical outreach mechanism. The design, then the permitting, then the construction. My screen is covered a little bit at the lower right, but if yours is not, it says LOMR for LOMAR, the letter of map revision. So once these substantial improvements are completed, we then submit an updated floodplain mapping to FEMA for their acceptance. And once they accept that, then those homes that were formerly located in the 100-year floodplain can no longer be located there. So it is a substantial process. In this particular case, there were a number of partners associated with that. One last piece we wanted to talk about since it impacts a lot of the major drainage way planning is a property acquisition. We have a line item in the six year CIP that uh, funds at about $600,000 a year. And we are opportunistic working with other departments and uh, with staff to basically purchase homes that are in the most critical of the four flood zones that Katie talked about before, the high hazard zone. This particular home was one located on university and by removing it, uh, it created a greater opportunity for Katie as the project manager to complete improvements on the upcoming Gregory. This particular home was actually relocated out to Lafayette. So there's an interesting story there, but Katie would have the details if, if you were curious. Now back to you, Katie. <laughs> All right, thank you, Douglas. Um, yes, yeah, so we have several projects that are currently in the design and construction phase. So I'm gonna highlight a few of these. At the, the top um, north of the map are two projects along Four Mile Cannon Creek, one at Broadway and one at 19th Street. For these two projects, Utilities is partnering with the Transportation Department to add some key flood improvements at the roadway crossings. So these improvements are being designed to ultimately accommodate a 50 year flood event, but um, the improvements cannot be fully utilized until downstream improvements are constructed. So we are going to have to put in um, some temporary um, blockages at, at Broadway to keep the flows in a similar condition what they are today until we're able to complete some further construction. Um, but we do try to partner with um, different divisions um, and departments where we can and be opportunistic with that. Um, so then also I want to point out at the left or the west side of the screen is the Gregory Canyon Creek project. So that's um, along where uh, a couple of structures have been removed. And on that project, we're partnering with the Mile High Flood District and um, for some channel and culvert improvements to convey a 10-year storm event. Um, so it's an older, more historic neighborhood with very tight site constraints site constraints. So although typically we aim for 100 year improvements, it's not always feasible. So we try to do what we can. Um, I'd also like to highlight two projects in the middle of the map. One is on Goose Creek and one is on Bear Creek near the Boulder Community Health uh, Facility. And these, both of these two um, projects are uh, creek restoration projects and they're in the final stages of construction right now. We're doing um, some, getting some revegetation and stuff going in that and finishing those up. Um, and they were both funded and managed by the Mile High Flood District. So they are definitely an important partner for us on, on many different projects. Um, so I'm now gonna speak a little bit about the master plan update that Douglas had mentioned. So we have started the process to update the stormwater and flood management utility master plan. Um, this is our overarching planning document for the uh, utility, the stormwater and flood utility. And so we are going to be reviewing and updating our guiding principles, developing recommendations for some future work items, looking at funding and developing a system for comprehensively prioritizing flood mitigation projects across the city. And... So there are many elements to the master plan. Um, tonight we 
touched on just a few of the topics that we are going to be revisiting. Some additional topics include emergency preparedness, regulations, and water quality. Groundwater is also a new topic that we are going to be looking into as part of this um, update. There are many related master plans, so I'm going to highlight a few. The Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan sets the framework for the city with policies that form the backbone of the stormwater and flood management master plan. Um, and I did include uh, a few of the um, pertinent sections in the, the packet for tonight's meeting. Um, the Greenways Master Plan covers our major drainage ways as well, um, and that is also approaching that 10-year mark. So we are planning to update that plan following the Flood and Stormwater Master Plan update. Uh, the Stormwater Master Plan has some recommended improvements to the local storm drainage system, which, which is generally a pipe system to convey flows from minor storm events. Um, and that plan was updated in 2017. So as far as our master planning process goes, we are we're currently getting our consulting team on board and working on engagement plan. Um, we'd like a comprehensive and robust, pu robust public engagement for this effort. And so part of our engagement will include working with a community working group. So we are working on the logistics to begin um, recruiting those members. Um, so a, a detailed schedule was also included in your packet. Um, this is a bit of a simplified version that highlights some of the key phases. So as I mentioned, we are starting to plan the public engagement um, after this check-in with council. So any feedback you have would be, uh, you know, is always um, welcome. Um, we are then gonna be moving into the technical review and analysis of the different program elements. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Douglas to talk about some of our, our flood needs and funding. Okay, so we're approaching the end of this presentation. Um, in preparation for this city council presentation, utility staff uh, went before the Water Resource Advisory Board a week ago. And on the subject of flood needs, this particular uh, map was a new one that we had not talked about before. And so one of the things we tried to convey here for city council was the level of conveyance capacity in the 16 drainage ways across the community. So you have a color carded chart, color coded in the lower right hand corner. And I guess the easiest one to start with would be the black color. And that shows you, for example, unimproved drainage ways. At the other end of the spectrum, there have been a number of capital projects uh, that have green, which is the 100 year capacity. So if you look in the center of this uh, map in the upper center, the green line that goes from east to west is the Goose Creek drainage way. And so those four phases over 20 years of projects show that that has a capacity basically between Boulder Creek all the way up to Folsom for a greater conveyance. You then see a black line on the west end of that. And that is the one mile section behind Edgewood that has 29 homes for which there is less than a 10 year capacity at this time. That is actually in the six year CIP. Further west of that, we would not refer to it as a major drainage way because it's in a more commercial area where we would deal with the pipe system and the stormwater uh, capacity that Katie spoke of before. So maybe the next slide. We tried to capture this then in tabular format to basically show that we have a number of projects that have been completed. We have a, a lot of miles of drainage way uh, that require some sort of improvement going forward. Katie alluded to the Gregory Creek project earlier in the presentation, and because of the density of homes and the expanse and the steepness, it was decided that a 10-year level of effort would best fit that element of the community. One of the things that is more flexible now is we have to determine what level of conveyance is appropriate for various uh, drainage ways throughout the community. There were a number of times in the early projects in the last 40 years, where because of the density and the lack of development, it was much easier to accomplish 100 year conveyance going forward. That is clearly not the case across the community as a whole. 
One last slide here that we've shown uh, to Council and the Water Resource Advisory Board before is really the flood need fundamentally. So this graph shows two things. In orange, it shows the number of flood policies for Boulder relative to 12 of our neighboring communities. The blue dots show the population. So if you look at the left side of your screen, you see that Boulder has over 4,000 flood policies. Now, one of our sister cities that is similar in size like Longmont or Fort Collins has on the order of 350 to 400. So although their population is almost identical, we have 10 times the flood policies. In fact, it's so extraordinary if you combine the populations of Colorado Springs and Denver at roughly 350,000 and 700,000 respectively to total over a million, we still have significantly greater flood policies despite their having a population of 10. So back to Katie's initial point of why Boulder has the flood risk it does, topography is a big part of it. The number of drainage ways is, the development for a community, Boulder, that was started in 1859 has tremendous development in regional areas, specifically along all of the corridors. And that fundamentally is what's driving the risk and that's why we're playing catch up in the way that we are. Okay, so a couple slides just super quickly on the CIP, the Capital Improvements Program. What you see is a pie chart on your right, which shows that this fluctuates a little bit, but by and large, this utility is funded at about $15 million a year. And we have that split roughly into 60%, you know, on the left side in the capital projects and about 40% on the other side in the operating. There's no hard science for that. The majority of the dollars are associated with the major drainage way programs. And the majority of dollars are on the capital side because it's a young utility and we are still building assets as opposed to maintaining them, which is more true of the water and wastewater utilities that we spoke of at the beginning of the presentation. Moving on, then we have a very simple breakdown of that nine and a half million dollars and what we talked about before. There are many, many components in the storm and flood utility. Uh, the major drainage way elements associated with it take about two thirds of the dollars. However, we also have an aggressive program for localized drainage projects and also a lining program and also an open cut program for the very storm sewers that have to deliver the runoff and the rainwater uh, to the major drainage ways. On the right, very simply, you see a breakdown of the $6.3 million. What this effectively says is we have about $2 million cash to spend, and that two thirds of this is tied up in debt service. And the debt service is the annual payment on the existing revenue bonds we have currently for the projects that have already been completed. So this is our last slide before we go to summary. There's nothing to talk about here. It was more to give council members an idea of a couple of the topics important, but not at the same level of the major drainage way that we did not talk about tonight. Uh, Katie has expertise in every one of these areas and can speak to any one of them if you have questions. Otherwise, we can pull up the summary slide and then throw it out to, to council members for questions. In summary, we wanted to remind you that the presentation fundamentally is speaking of the number of drainage ways and the need in the city. We have significant flood program needs across the community, north, south, east, and west. Katie noted that we have a master plan update for what would be the overarching master plan similar to the other utilities, and that is estimated at an 18 month to two year effort and has been started. The last point is that we do have limited funds like any of the utilities, but the difference here, instead of trying to address existing assets, we have a critical need for new infrastructure for the next 100 years. So thank you very much for the time. I think we might have gone over 20 minutes. Uh, I'll throw it out to questions or back to Joe or, or, or to Sam, please. Great, well, thank you, Douglas. <clears throat> and um, Joe, is there anything you wanted to uh, finish on? before we start asking questions. No, I um, thank you for uh, Douglas and, and Katie for putting all of that together. And I think uh, that was a good summary of, of all the different aspects. And, and there were probably twice as many subjects that we could have gotten into as you 
saw the on Douglas's last slide. I think one point I would emphasize that Douglas made in the presentation is that the, I think he said the storm uh, flood and stormwater utility was formed in the early 1970s. And so the, the challenge is that we have an old city that was developed largely before modern uh, floodplain regulations came into play. And so um, it, that's not uncommon in Colorado, but that, that's why we talk about playing catch up and, and trying to get back around and, and get things up to modern standards, which is a challenge. Okay, very good. Um, thank you to everyone who was involved in putting this presentation together. Um, very helpful. I'll turn to council and see if council has any questions. I don't see any hands right now, but I will remind us that the two questions in the memo <clears throat> were, are there questions about the flood management program? And then the second question was, is there any feedback on the planned update to the master plan for the storm and flood management utility? So now I have hands. I've got Rachel, Mark, Adam, Mary, and Aaron. So Rachel, you're up. Um, thank you, Joe and Douglas for that awesome presentation. It was very um, illuminating and educational. And just one question, you had a slide up there, I think Douglas that talked about the um, numbers of years of protection that we have in the city. We've got, I don't know, six, 10 year mitigation projects and 1100 year or something like that. And then it shows zero 500. Is there anything between 100 and 500 or is 100 the max that we've ever done? Douglas, you want to take that one? Uh, sure, yeah, 100 is the max that we've done. And historically, most communities uh, do projects to the ability that they can uh, to that level because of the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program regulations. Um, a couple of the key components, that, that circle of life that Katie talked about, when you complete a project and you do a letter of map revision, you then are in ability to, to remap the area for which the improvements were completed. And let's say, for example, one of these projects took 150 homes out of the designated floodplain. Uh, it is required that you have flood insurance for federally backed mortgages. And since most people have a mortgage, it puts you in a position to get out from under that. Now, you could still carry that mortgage going forward. But to answer your question directly, there are no set improvements between the 100 and the 500 year specifically. The 500 year is maybe, yeah. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. 500 year what? I was just gonna say the 500 year is a designation that the city of Boulder started a few years ago with respect to the critical facilities list, both uh, facilities like the water and wastewater treatment facilities that we own and also hospitals and daycares and other facilities like that that Katie mentioned. Okay, thanks. And I wanna jump in and colloquy on that, <laughs> Doug, if that's okay. Um, so the 500 year, in the 100 year are mapped as part of the same flood mapping project for FEMA, is that correct? Katie, do you wanna take that one to explain the zones specifically about how FEMA looks at that? Sure, yeah, it's, it's typical when we do floodplain mapping updates to do, um, to map the 100 and the 500 year. Those are the, the standard FEMA designations and they, use them um, for where flood insurance requirements are and then also different regulations. And so they're, it's pretty standard and they have um, guidelines for the storm events associated with those. Thank you. And it's been, I don't know, three years or so <clears throat> since we did the critical facilities ordinance, which then looked to certain facilities in the 500 year floodplain are regulated. Is that common in other communities that have flood risk that they um, have maps for both the 100 and the 500, but for the 500, they do a little bit, and for 100, it has the insurance requirements? Yes, a lot of that is um, really FEMA standards. And then the FEMA and then the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, encourage communities to develop critical facilities ordinances. And, and we decided to have that really focus on the 500 year floodplain, extend it beyond what our normal regulations go to. Okay, and that was good. adopted back in 2013. 2013, okay, thank you. So now I've got Mark, Adam, Mary, and Aaron. Mark, you're up. 
Uh, Douglas, Katie, thank you. That was a, a, a very in informative uh, presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions, and they're based on the materials we were sent in preparation for this meeting. And because I have my notes, but I don't have it in front of me, please feel free to correct me if I get any of the facts wrong. Um, the is it correct that the Upper Goose Creek project is scheduled for a $24 million um, capital expense in 2023? Yes, Mark, I can speak to that one. Um, one of the slides that you saw were the what we call the major drainage way improvements, which happened over a period of 20 years coming east to west. Then there was that section that was in black, which has less than a 10 year capacity in the section behind Edgewood. When the stormwater master plan was completed a number of years ago, it is a master plan specifically for the piped improvements, not the major drainage ways. And we differentiate in master plans between tier one, tier two, and tier three. Those are high, medium, and low priority projects. Projects. So what came out of that master plan, the number one tier one project was what was called the Upper Goose Creek Basin. And this requires a comprehensive piped network in the vicinity of 19th and Alpine all the way west through Colony Market and that area near Ideal across through the hospital up to 9th Street and up to 4th Street. So there were two projects originally identified, Mark, in the CIP. One was the pipe section and one was drainage way improvements behind Edgewood. We couldn't do the pipe section first because if we increase the capacity of the pipes to a five-year capacity, we didn't want to discharge those additional waters to 19th and Alpine where that one mile section goes. So what you see in the CIP is a 24, $25 million proper project that is about $15 million in a pipe network and about $10 million to improve the capacity of that section behind Edgewood to a five or 10 year conveyance capacity. And how is that project going to be funded? Is that, will that be another bond issue? For something that size, that would be a bond. And that's going to come hard on the heels of a bond issue for CU South in whatever configuration that, that ultimately ends up. You know, our six-year CIP is our best estimate at any given window for when we think staff has the capacity and when we can pay for those. At any given time after we've bonded, we reassess our capacity at that time for the next one. I, I noticed in those materials, again, assuming I am correct, that, that you had a $40 million bond proceeds for CU South. Uh, but the estimates that we've been looking at show a, a far larger project. Are you expecting a mile high um, district contribution towards that? Or is that is that $40 million number not the correct number? So the 40 million is not the correct number. That was in the CIP for last year's budget process. And on an annual basis, we update all the capital estimates for all of our projects. When you saw the previous presentation for South Boulder Creek, you saw a range of what was the, the current estimates between 66 and 96 million. So that particular project now factors in a number of components that were not anticipated before. It is much easier on a piped project like the Goose Creek project to anticipate the cost. So we would not expect increases in that on a percentage basis like what you've seen elsewhere. And last, lastly, part of your part of the materials we received was a sample bill. Um, with a charge for stormwater and flood. Um, has anybody done an analysis of what that charge will look like or what the, the nature of the increase will be when we factor in the current estimates for CU South and the $24 million for Upper Goose Creek? Uh, and I don't know if you have any other projects that are going to need to be bonded in the next couple of years. But what, what's the impact going to be on those charges um, for the average home? So I, I can answer those, but I'll defer to Ken, who is the utilities financial manager, um, if, if he'd like to speak to the, the, the relative nature of, of the debt service associated with bonds that size. Yeah, thanks, Douglas. Generally speaking, we have for the uh, South Boulder Creek project, that $66 million project or so, we've stated that that would itself involve a potentially 50% rate increase to the storm flood project. And then um, 
and it depends in in which year that project happens along with the goose creek projects but also there'll be in douglas with the goose creek 24 million dollar one off the top of my head i don't remember what it was but you know it'll be 50 percent for the south boulder creek kind of in talking today's if we did a today's rate increase and then it would be about another let's see about another I think it was about another 20 20 percent ken i believe for the goose creek one and presumably if the estimates go up those numbers will go up commensurately yeah that's right the the depending on how much the debt service is for those projects will require rate increases as those debt service amounts go up so we're looking at very very significant increases in that in that category of uh, charge yeah in terms of a, per, a percentage increase and like a 50 percent rate increase if we were to do that in the near term that would be about eight dollars a month on a single family residential bill an additional eight dollars a month on the on that bill okay thank you appreciate it very good i've got adam mary and aaron adam you're up so mine is more just commentary than a question but um it's interesting to me this even though we don't have the full um plan in front of us it's pretty clear that this sort of lines up with the um, fire department plan in the fact that we have some critically underfunded life and um, safety needs and we had them before we lost you know one out of every seven dollars in our sales tax revenue um, so to me this is kind of just a request that when the finance committee is looking at things to make sure that we really look at the, the core principles of what the town needs um, and also look at alternative means of funding since we're, we're critically funding starved on some of these really important needs. Um, and that's, that's really my only feedback, but I really look forward to looking at the whole master plan when it does come to fruition. Great. Thank you, Adam. Mary and Aaron, Mary. Thank you, Katie, Douglas, and Joe, for an outstanding presentation. I, I always find this stuff really fascinating. Um, my first question has to do with um, kind of is um, Adam's comment was a great segue into my questions. Um, one of them has the first one has to do with funding and how um, what I know about the Mile, Fly, Flood, Mile High Flood District is that um, they are looking at a CP, um, a CIP as well, and um, and they fold in our CIPs into their CIP, and so there's money that's being put aside um, for the big projects, such as, for example, South Boulder Creek. Um, so my question is, um, what percentage or what amount is being um, put together by the Mile High Flood District towards that project? And um, is that factored into the numbers that we were just talking about with Mark? Um, so that's my question. Sure, um, I can start with that one. So Mary, uh, the Mile High Flood District uh, provides funding for a number of communities. And they recently sent us a copy of their five-year CIP uh, for Boulder County. And so some of those are other towns and some of those are in the greater community uh, in the unincorporated areas. In general terms, uh, the city of Boulder receives about half of their total allocation. And their total allocation is about $3 million a year. So to give you a reference, City of Boulder projects receive about $1.5 million a year from the Mile High Flood District. Now, they don't specifically tell us which projects we can use that on. We, our staff sits down with theirs, and then we talk about um, which projects we would like to do it in which particular years. So if you will, we sort of blend our CIPs together. So they could all go toward something like South Boulder Creek, or they could go toward Goose Creek. And as long as they're going for design of construction, 
in facilities that they uh, have faith in and are in agreement with. Uh, it's it's a very it's a very cooperative teamwork. Thank you. Um, my next question is um, kind of also folds in with um, Adam's comment. Um, in the budget strategy um, subcommittee, we were presented with the um, the budgeting for community resilience report that came through a DOLA grant. And in that DOLA grant, there are several recommendations about how to move forward with master plans. Um, one of the recommendations is about, well, the, several of the recommendations have to do with developing um, KPIs. And I forget what that stands for, the KPI, but um, that was that process or um, format was piloted by the fire master plan. And I'm wondering if there are plans for this master plan to um, follow those recommendations from that report. I, I might kick that one over to Katie. I'm not, I don't know the answer to that question. We may have to get back, um, unless you know it, Katie. Yeah, so um, that's a great question, and I'm not sure about the answer to that. I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about it, and I would definitely be interested in in looking into it and seeing if there's recommendations that we can follow on that. Um, I do know that you know when it comes to fund, you know, some of the funding for one thing I wanted to mention the funding for the utilities. Um, you know, as you mentioned, it's through the bills, and there is that difference in sales tax revenue and um, the revenue that that we deal with with the utilities um, just to kind of remind people about that even though the there's decreases in sales tax um, we're not necessarily going to see the same sorts of decreases in the flood utility because it is for utility bills so Mary, I'm also going to try to answer the question for a minute. Um, the DOLA grant that we got, we piloted, of course, as you know, with the fire master plan. Um, actually, the the stormwater master plan and all of the utility master plans already use key performance indicators as we figure out what the future is of our infrastructure. And so um, while we haven't actually as the finance committee spoken necessarily with Joe and Katie and Douglas about um, using that process, in fact, utilities operations and utilities infrastructure is always focused on key performance indicators. And the items that Katie went through about the elements of the master plan are part of that. And indeed, the um, designing for the 10, 50, or 100 year uh, flood is related to the key performance indicators. So that's what we will be guided by. So I have actually myself no concerns about the fact that this will comply with the DOLA recommendations. Thank you, Jane and um, Katie and Douglas and Joe. Okay, thank you, Mary. Aaron? Yeah, thanks for that, everyone. Appreciate the presentations. Uh, just one question uh, in the master plan. Well, I'll just say, so in the um, packet you provided uh, some projects from the CIP and in the master plan, um, will you have a, include like a very, very rough estimate of the costs of building out the network to what we hope to build it out to, you know, just kind of order of magnitude kind of stuff. So we have a sense of what the, the total needs of the system are. Douglas, do you want to kind of explain the overarching master plan, what we intend to accomplish there versus more fine grain master plans? Sure. And then I can I can kick it out to Katie for specific answers. One of the difficult things, Aaron, of the overarching master plan like this is that it typically doesn't get into the delineation of projects and costs. Um, in each of the three utilities, subset to the overarching master plan, we have specialty master plans. And that's why when I referenced the stormwater master plan, which was just for the pipe system, it's very easy to look at a network of 160 miles and look at size and condition and to what degree those existing pipes in the ground serve the community for the two year and the five year storm event. What's much more difficult is actually what you're asking for. And it's not impossible uh, to do back of the napkin estimates but a greater granularity is difficult for a couple of reasons, and Katie can add to what I'll say. But the floodplain mapping 
for the many drainage ways are all at a different generation. And therefore the mitigation efforts that follow those are also out of sequence as well. And so there are a number of different components that come in. The map that we shared today is, is a great step forward to have a conversation in terms of what is realistic in terms of the type of projects that we could build throughout the community. One of the questions came up, for example, years ago after the fourth Goose Creek project, would we in fact continue the 100 year improvements up to 19th and Alpine? And the decision was made long before I started that the, it was no, because at 29 homes at a half a million to a million dollars a year, it, it didn't represent the uh, benefit to the community. And so those dollars were then focused on one or two other major drainage ways, like Four Mile, for example, and all those improvements, and also Wonderland and also Skunk and a couple of those. So it's a long answer. We will do our best as we scope this master plan to help council understand the interplay of these 16 drainage ways and what is realistic going forward. Yeah, thanks for that. That makes sense. And I guess the the request I would have is that whatever you can include in the master plan to give us and the community a sense of like what's left, you know, and, and what the scope of that and, 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 you know, the number of years involved in working on it again, not expecting uh, very fine grained numbers, but like, I, I love the map that you presented tonight. That was really helpful um, about uh, what level of flood protection has been implemented on those uh, different drainage ways. Um, another one that would be helpful would be to compare that with what level we plan to implement on those various drainage ways, right? Because like Gregory Canyon that we did, I think my first year on council, um, and when I say we, I mean all of you, I just happened to vote on it. Um, you know, that was decided for the 10-year 10, 10 level of protection, I believe, because of practical practicality reasons. So getting that sense of, you know, what's what's been done and then what's left to do. Um, so we have a sense of the whole big decades long project um, in a very rough outline, I think would be really valuable. I, I appreciate the question very much and, and we will work hard on that messaging piece. It's a very natural question to ask in light of updating a master plan that's 16 years old. Right, thank you. Great. So I see no other hands raised. So I'm going to ask a couple quick questions here. This one is just out of curiosity. Um, Douglas, I think you can probably answer this. There is a mile high flood district funded project going on in Goose Creek right now. So what is the project that's going on in Goose Creek? So I can answer that one, but I'm going to kick it to Katie because she's managing it. But I, I will preface one or two sentences. The Mile High Flood District, Sam, contributes dollars toward capital programs where they can fund up to 50% of the capital improvements. However, when it comes to the maintenance element of what they do, they can provide 100% of the maintenance. And so that's my segue to give it to, the, to Katie, who knows quite a bit about that project. Yeah, thanks, Douglas. Um, and thanks for the question and the interest in the project. So that project is one of Mile High Flood District's uh, major maintenance projects. And so um, projects that go beyond the capabilities of what we would do for like a routine maintenance with, with our crews, we really lean heavily on the Mile High Flood District and work with them on areas that need significant um, reconstruction or major sediment removal and things like that. So the Goose Creek project is, it's a channel reconstruction. It removed a lot of sediment, a lot of cattails, um, realigned, basically um, brought the channel, it had been degraded, filled in with sediment and, and vegetation. It's bringing it back to more of its um, original design um, capabilities. And when it had filled in with sediment, we were having um, issues with the multi-use trail flooding really frequently. Um, so we did a, some modifications to the culvert there at the railroad. Um, just not the, I guess not the culvert itself, but a little wing wall there and, and regraded the path to try to solve some of those um, flooding issues and get that capacity back in the creek. And so that's what that project is. Great, thank you. And just so I can follow up on <clears throat> what Douglas um, put out there for us. So is Mile High Flood District covering a major um, chunk of the cost for that uh, maintenance? They're covering that project 100%. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I'll just comment that um, 
you know, it's tough because we are in one of the most flood prone cities in Colorado by a long shot. Um, but it does lend itself to the greenways that we have now um, because, you know, I sat for one year on the urban drainage uh, board. And it was interesting. One of our projects, uh, the, um, the Wonderland Creek project got featured at the first meeting I was at. And so they talked all about the Wonderland Creek project. And um, one of the folks there highlighted the, the um, bike path along Wonderland Creek. And so a couple of people approached me afterwards and said, well, how do you handle having bike paths near your floodways? And I said, well, we just, transportation takes care of the maintenance of the path and utilities take care of the maintenance of the drainage way. And there were a lot of people who were just totally confused about the concept of putting your bike paths along your floodways. So I just wanted to say that that is one of the best things about the way that we manage our floodways is they give us alternative transportation elements as well. So um, one more question and I'll be done. On slide 31, um, which is the tabular um, piece of the presentation where you talk about how many miles of our floodways have what level of flood protection. So we've got 11 miles that have 100 year um, capacity. And then there's 25 miles that have less than 100 year in some way or another. So the first question is, how will the CU South project impact that slide? So just will it bring some of those 25 miles that are less than 100 year into 100 year? What will be the impact of CU South on that tabular chart that you showed? Uh, so I'll, I'll start that generically. Uh, if you recall on what, what the South Boulder Creek proposal is, Sam, there are three phases to it that basically work in a northerly direction. The most southerly one is the detention facility on the south side of 36. Then there are significant improvements moving up toward Manhattan Middle School and then all the way up toward the golf course. So this project differs in that it's not starting from downstream with drainage way improvements, but the detention facility itself because of the capacity and the mechanism for how it would release water slowly back to the drainage way would address the 100-year improvements. What's remarkable about what's being proposed there, it also addresses improvements that are in the West Valley, which are outside of the major drainage way. And that's why that proposal is so different. But the intention would be exactly, as you said, would be to move areas that were in the less than 10 uh, but I don't specifically into 100 year conveyance, you know, all the way up to Arapaho over some number of decades for the three phases. Got it. And in the first phase, it might move a few miles um, from the less than 100 to the um, 100. You know, I would I would have to defer to Brandon's expertise on that. Um, I know that the outlet structure that you've heard a bit about releases water into Veeley, and Veeley Channel releases it back into South Boulder Creek, not far north. Um, and so it's been a little bit since I've brushed up to speed on the hydrology of all the return flows, but I'd be happy to chase that one down for you. I'm just curious if you if you happen to come across it or it's pretty easy, it'd be fun to know because that's going to be an expensive project. I know it's got the other two phases. It's, it would just be interesting to be able to point to what it does. Um, I guess that's yeah, all. One thing I guess I'd like to add to that is with the South Boulder Creek is a little bit unique in that we're not really looking at the entire floodplain. That project is really focusing on the West Valley overflow. So it's not... It's, it's trying to mitigate flows that have already left the channel. Um, and so it's not really doing improvements along the channel. So you might not see that same correlation. I see, very good. Well, thanks very much for this. This was a, a fascinating presentation and um, I appreciate Kirk being here um, from the Water Resources Advisory Board. And I invite Kirk, do you have any closing comments that you wanna give us about Brad's take on this? So I see Kirk is here as an attendee. Let me go ahead and unmute him. He's an attendee, so bear with me for one moment. Yep. Okay, Kirk, you, you should be now? able to speak now. Can you hear me now? We can. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, I think staff has done a great job of, a job of summarizing 
the goals and intentions and the, the limitations. I mean, we've got a lot of areas of risk, you know, the utilities are working everywhere in town to minimize risk. And the, I, I think that, that we can afford the master plan update and your utilities division funding separate from sales tax and property tax can afford the proposals that are being discussed. Very good. Well, thank you all for the presentation um, and the great work doing this. We're leading up to the master plan ultimately. So that'll be a, a big milestone. Um, thank you, Kirk, for being here as well. And I'll turn it back over to Debbie. Okay, your next item is the ballot items from uh, the Charter Committee. And I believe that uh, Cheryl Patelli is going to start with this presentation. This We normally do have the finance department start because we often take a look at our tax measures. I don't believe we have any tax measures this year, but Cheryl has prepared the um, presentation. So Cheryl. Hey Sam, real quick. Adam, yes. Uh, can I request a really short break? Uh, sure. About eight o'clock. Okay, um, why don't we take a five minute break and be back here at 810 and Cheryl can kick us off.
Thanks for that, Sam. You're welcome, Adam. Um, let's see if we got everyone here. Adam, Sam, Mark, Mary, Bob, Rachel, Juni, nearby. Yep, I think we're there. There's Aaron. So, Cheryl, if you want to go ahead and kick us off. Sure, thanks. Um, good, good evening, uh, members of council. Chris, would you mind putting up the presentation? Thank you. And next slide, please. Thanks. So on the agenda tonight, we have three items that were brought forward by the Council Charter Committee. And I do want to thank that committee. Um, Rachel Mirabai and Mary are, uh, are all members of that committee and they've been super helpful this year um, during this process. Uh, those three items are increasing the size of the Art Commission, adjusting council compensation payment process, and then allowing council to waive charter requirements during emergencies. And Kathy Haddock will be here this evening to discuss these three. And then I have a couple slides. Um, we don't have any other potential ballot items that staff is recommending this evening, but just a couple slides uh, to remind you information regarding property and sales tax. And then I will finish the presentation with next steps regarding ballot measures. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy for the next slide. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, the, the, if we can go, I think we're gonna to need to go two slides ahead to the increasing the size of the arts, perfect. Um, so if you may recall that last time there were charter amendments, um, it allowed for council when they were originally forming a commission, whether or not to have it a five member or seven member commission. However, existing commissions were not changed at the time. Um, and the Arts Commission has requested that its board be expanded from five to seven members. Some of the reasons are that there are currently several subcommittees that have significant workload and they would like to distribute those assignments more evenly across the board members. So that would require a change to section 130. And if that is something that you want us to pursue, we would come back to you with proposed ballot issue language for that item. The next one was, if we can go to the next slide, is the council compensation payment process. And this is not a request to increase council compensation at all, but the, um, the way that it is drafted at this time, it's for attending 52 or up to 52 meetings in a year. And so there is, you get paid for every meeting up front and then towards the end of the year, you don't get start paying as you get more than 52. But for those who have elected to take benefits from the city, they are equal payments throughout the whole year. Plus the city pays every two weeks. So there's 26 pay periods. The result is that sometimes council members pay does not cover their benefits or deductions and they have to pay the city money. And then the next pay period that the, there's not that. So what we would like to do is um, do an amendment that would simplify that payment process, make the pay for a total of 52 meetings a year and have it spread consistently over the whole year. So again, if you want to do that one, we do have count or ballot language that we would propose at your next meeting. And then the last one was brought up at the um, charter committee and um, this one, I'm not sure there was a recommendation on. I'll let the committee speak to that, but something more for you all to discuss. Um, but what has become clear in doing the emergency, dealing with the COVID emergencies is that there are people requesting that council make changes to the charter um, that right now there is not the authority to do even in an emergency. So the suggestion is that, and we're not concerned what the next emergency is gonna be. I mean, if we got flooding at the same time as we had COVID like Michigan did, it, we'd be much more limited than we are. Um, and so 
whether there should be a waiver of, in the case of declared emergencies, for actions that council may need to take to deal with the emergency that are that are not consistent with the charter. We specifically wanted to exclude executive sessions or increasing council compensation um, for those times. I would argue that neither one of those is necessary for an emergency, but uh, we want to be really careful. Uh, and this would satisfy some of the issues that have been raised during this emergency. So again, if that's something you want us to pursue, we would bring it forward to you at another meeting. So those are the quest. The next slide is the questions that we have for you on each one of those, and I'm happy to answer any questions. If you want to go to the next slide, Chris. Great. Thank you, Kathy, for that. Okay. So Let's pause here. And so I assume this is questions about the um, three that have been brought forward um, in tonight's presentation. So I've got Bob, Mary, Mark, and Aaron. Bob, go ahead. This is probably as much a question for Jane as anybody. Um, on the last, um, I guess what I call the emergency provision uh, proposal, um, can, Jane, can you give us some examples of things that um, you would have liked council to be able to have done in this current emergency that we were not able to do? So th in, in a way, this question is less for me and more for council, but I think what was in mind were the ideas about um, reducing the number of signatures required for a petition or changing the timeline on that or changing um, petition and initiative requirements. Uh, there's one other that I would like to mention is the charter prohibits giving free water. And um, that's that's been something of a challenge for us. Okay, thanks. Okay, Mary, Mark, and Aaron. Mary? Yeah, my mine was going to be more of a comment um, and I'll, I'll add to what Jane and, and Bob have commented um, with respect to initiative petitions. The idea of being able to, um, I think Jane brought this up, is um, change the number of signatures required in the timeline, um, as well as um, being able to transfer signatures um, to the following year. So in other words, suspend collection, but resume um, when things have, when conditions have changed. So um, that that's another example of the things that, um, that would have been helpful to be able to do. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Mary. Um, then I've got Mark and Aaron. Mark? Uh, yeah, my, mine is also in the nature of the comment. Um, uh, as described here, the, um, the third potential ch uh, charter provision is very, very broad, and I think it needs to be very carefully circumscribed. To me, um, uh, I would focus more on uh, financial flexibility in a time of emergency, um, not something broader um, in terms of changing our electoral processes. Um, uh, you know, I, the, the potential scope of this is unlimited. I mean, would we be able to waive uh, height limitations? Um, you know, things that are unrelated to the exact a financial crisis that we're experiencing. Um, so I'm very concerned about how this is drafted and its specificity um, and how we make it as narrow as possible so that it is an instrument to be able to navigate a crisis such as what we're in. Uh, and when that crisis is over, that power you know quickly goes away um, and we can at least say to the community, this is a necessary tool 
for our financial survival, not a tool of convenience to circumvent uh, charter provisions that already exist. Thanks. Could I all agree on that? Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> Just that we did discuss um, in the committee ways that we would want to um, buffer against abuse. So the um, exercise of that uh, power would be limited to a super majority of council and it would have to be tethered to the whatever the um, named uh, state of emergency related to. So I don't see how like a height limit could be circumvented because what emergency could that possibly be responding to? And, and in terms of financial, like, you know, if it's a health crisis like we're in right now, it might not be directly tethered to finance, but you might need, um, as an example, we were a little bit confused back in early March, like, are we allowed to have remote meetings? And so that would be an example of if the charter had prohibited it, we need to emergency um, be able to change things like that to address a, a current crisis. So that's what we were visualizing. And I think that we could probably find the language to come up with it, but just wanted to put that out there, what we were thinking of on the committee. If, if I may also colloquy with, with Rachel, um, that gets more interesting to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm simply responding to the, the language as submitted to us. And, and to me, it's, it's overly broad. And as with many things, the devil's in the detail. So yes, I mean, the, to the extent that we can get- Yeah, I, 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 I figured without any context, it would be like, what the heck are we talking yes. about? So context will be okay. everything in this. <laughs> No, and if I may colloquy as well, um, I agree with with Rachel, and um, thankfully the the ability to meet remotely is was done by ordinance and not charter change, so we could we could manage to do it. But things of that nature, and I agree with Mark that it needs to be very precise and. Um, and clearly delineate it as to its relationship to an emergency. Great, Aaron and then Bob. So my question was pretty much the same as what uh, Mark just uh, asked and Rachel and Mary answered very nicely. But so I'll just make one uh, little additional comment that, you know, the, the guardrails would be important for something like this. And um, so another thing would be duration would be a kind of guardrail that we might put on this, right? That, um, you know, it couldn't, you couldn't institute it for 10 years, say, you know, maybe there's a limited time period. So that's another thought on that. And I guess just while I'm talking about it, that we might, if, if we're gonna put this on the ballot, we might spend some time uh, looking at uh, items in the charter that would be um, something consider varying in, in a future emergency if we're gonna make that case to the voters. Bob? Um, since we've moved on a comment, I'll, I'll, I'll throw mine in here. I, I, I agree with Mark, I'm, I'm concerned, I guess I'm still struggling to understand um, what we were unable to do that we wish we would have been able to do. Um, I think Jane and her team have done a wonderful job of managing through this crisis, including on financial uh, adeptness. Um, we were able to meet remotely and we were able to do a lot of things. So the only thing I've really heard so far is, gosh, it would have been nice if we could have waived the number of signatures on the, um, the ballot petitions, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and, um, but I'm not sure that we would have waived that. There, th those, those numbers are in the charter for a reason, and that is to protect uh, those people who um, don't want a provision to go forward. They want to make sure that um, there is a certain number of people in the community who are supportive of something before it goes on the ballot. And um, I, I, I still struggle a little bit to understand how that directly relates to our dealing with the emergency. It certainly is a consequence of the emergency, but it doesn't deal with the emergency. So I have yet to hear a charter provision that we would have liked to have waived um, to allow us to deal with this emergency. So I'm, I, I remain skeptical that this is necessary. Thank you, Bob. Colloquy from charter perspective again, just that I, I think that um, we saw again in early March that we had not anticipated what we were going to need for this pandemic. And so I think that the when Tom raised this, it was sort of an awareness that 
you don't really know what's going to come up and what might be necessary. And so we wanted to leave some maneuvering room that we won't be in this position again as a city next year or in 50 years or however long it's going to be until something like this arises again. And we wouldn't necessarily be able to anticipate what we might need to change because we don't know what the next exact crisis would be. So it was a way again with the guardrails of things like super majority and it has to be related to the issue at hand that um, a future commonsensical bright council would not abuse it and the guardrails would be in place and we would have that option. If I could just call it on that. I, I mean, we've in the last decade, we've lived through two types of emergencies. We had a horrible flood, and I'm not aware of any charter provisions that tied our hands back then. And we are now going through a pandemic, and I'm not aware of any charter provisions that are tying our hands now as it relates to responding to the emergency. And so uh, I, I get the fact that it would be a supermajority, although that's really only one more than the five that normally takes to pass something. So this doesn't give me a whole lot of comfort. And again, if somebody could point to something that said, gosh, we would have done this to address the emergency or any of the emergencies we've had over the past, uh, whatever history, um, but we couldn't because the charter tied our hands and we couldn't uh, waive the charter, but I, I, I've yet to hear a good example of that. So I remain unpersuaded. And then Aaron, and then I'm gonna go. Yeah, well, just a further colloquy on that. I mean, Tom did mention also the, the charter doesn't allow providing free water. And that is sounds like something that we might want to be able to do at some point. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll just reiterate my point that um, if we're going to consider this, that uh, that we spend a little time looking, looking at uh, possible use cases. Okay, um, so I guess I've got a few thoughts. Um, one thought is there were multiple things suggested and we really only talked about one of them. Um, I guess for me, uh, the Arts Commission and the Council Compensation are both things that should be done at some point, but I don't think they rise to the level of needing to do them this year. I think we have an emergency one that's on discussion right now, which I'll get to in a moment. And then we're going to have something, I believe, where we talk about um, signature deadlines and so on. So I think there are some things which are actually important to do now. I think the emergency one is good because we're thinking about it now in the middle of an emergency and trying to figure out what we need to do and not do relative to what the charter constrains us around. <clears throat> and then the other one we're going to talk about um, signature deadlines and signature requirements and so on. I think that is looking ahead to when next year we'll be able to gather um, electronic signatures for petitioning once that's in place. And so if we don't have our rules tight <clears throat> and then we go into the first time ever that we're doing electronic signature gathering and we still have some uncertainty, it's just going to get further confused by the fact that we have the electronic signature gathering. So I see um, no reason to move through the art commission one or the council compensation one. And I would just pause there and ask for people to colloquy if they disagree with that. If people would like to move those ahead, I'd like to hear about it. So Rachel, I have my Jamie, hand up. Yep. Yeah, I, I was getting there. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to make the case for the uh, council members pay schedule measure moving forward. Um, I, I think that Historically, it is um, easier for people who are wealthy or retired or um, have other sources. Sorry about the cat here. If, any, if everybody's hearing the cat meow, I have no ability to help that. Um, to be able to serve on our city council. And I think that we need to be um, aware that we have to take steps to make it more amenable for people who are not wealthy to be able to serve on council without undue burden. And so as it is, if you take health insurance like I do, because as, as Kathy explained, the um, pay schedule is not level. Some days, sometimes like the city will charge your credit card or dip into your bank account. And um, so for people who have uh, enough money, that's not a big deal. But if you are living paycheck to paycheck, you need consistent and reliable pay dates. Um, so I support this going on the ballot this year so that people running in 2021 can count on a steady paycheck as part of this job. Even though our pay will remain exactly the same, um, this will benefit working class people. So um, I, I don't think it uh, should be delayed. 
Okay, I've got Junie, Aaron, and Mark, and then Mary. I just wanted to say I support the idea of uh, for the for the pay change, but I anyway, no one can live in Boulder on eleven thousand dollars. I just think that discussion about working class people, I don't think it really there is any connection between the two, but I do support it. Um, my question or my comment was about number three, the charter provision for the super majority of council to waive charter provision in the event of emergency. So are we moving forward with that or is it off the table as of right now? Well, I don't think we know yet. <clears throat> so I was trying to okay. organize our discussion to go one, two, three, um, because I thought one and two would be easy, but I'm apparently wrong about that. So why don't we frame it up and talk about whether we want one and two to move forward, go through that, and then I think there's a longer discussion around the emergency. Uh, well, I, do you want me to save my question for number three for later then? If it's a question, go ahead and ask it. Uh, yes, my question was, why does it say the word supermajority? What's the difference between five? And also, can we add for framing, whether it's a national emergency, life-threatening, or flood emergency? So I'm thinking maybe some of the framing can also help with some of the issues that we're having. Okay. Aaron, Mark, Barry, nearby, and Adam. Aaron? Aaron, you're on mute. I never do that, but now I do. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I'm perfectly happy to to move those first two forward. I'll just say in terms of the Arts Commission, they sent us a really heartfelt letter um, this last year about the need for more people. And they actually were one of the boards that met right away uh, during this period, um, during the COVID period, uh, so that they could get money out to the community uh, as quickly as possible um, because of the grants that they distribute. So it seems uncontroversial and, um, and it would be, I would, would appreciate responding to their request. I see, seems like it could move forward this year. And the second one on council compensation uh, feels like a kind of a, a cleanup measure that makes things a, a little easier for, for council members who might be living um, a little closer to the financial edge. So I'm fine moving that forward too. Mark? Uh, I think Rachel is, is absolutely correct about the benefits of the, uh, the pay uh, charter provision. But I also think Sam is correct that there's no particular need to have that conversation at the moment. Um, and I would put it off. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's beneficial to some council members. Um, and I'm a little reluctant to uh, put on a charter amendment that's mostly beneficial to council members. Uh, and, and Junie is also quite correct that uh, no matter how you slice and dice our $11,000 a year, um, it's not going to be sufficient for someone to live on. And I don't think it's going to make a material difference uh, to whether someone runs for council or does not run for council. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a good amendment, but I think its time is not quite ripe. And I would agree that it could be put off for one more year. Great, thank you. I've got Mary I'm just going to colloquy real quick on the uh, that point that's been brought up twice now. Um, I think that eleven thousand dollars a year could make a difference to somebody running for council if they're making um, some amount that combined with eleven thousand dollars a year would get you uh, into um, a, a less um, financially unstable quality of life. So. I don't think that we can pretend to presume or know um, what anybody who might be running for council's situation is other than right now we make it very difficult um, to take on this job, but we can make it easier for people who could be combining this with another job to um, make a go financially in Boulder. If I may call job in control. I may colloquy for a minute. Uh, Rachel, I do not disagree with you on that. Um, I, I think it's a good uh, a good proposal. I'm just not sure that it needs to be done this year. 
I, I'm not disputing the substance of it. I think you're right. It's just a, for me, it's a matter of timing. So Mary, Mirabai, Adam, and Bob. Mary? So I think the um, Arts Commission one should go forward um, because it is something that was requested by the Arts Commission and it is um, a workload question is um, they they simply can not get through the amount of work and reading and evaluation of grant proposals that they have to get through in or in order to to meet their mission. So um, I do think that that one could move forward. Um, although I do agree um, with Sam and Mark that um, it is about timing, um, but I think that the workload will exist for the Arts Commission once we um, come out of this, however long it might take, um, the workload will be there. And it, it seems like, a, um, as, as, as um, Aaron put it, a non-controversial item. Um, if, it, if we had a controversial item before us, I would be more reluctant. Um, as I've said before in the uh, petition discussions, is that what we want to do right now is we want to keep our community together and avoid divisiveness. So, um, so I th I think that one should go forward. Um, the council pay one, I'm I'm of two minds on that one. Um, I did approach the charter committee um, to remove that one from the recommended recommended list um, for the reasons that Mark has stated. It's a timing issue. Um, on the other hand, um, when you combine the council pay, which is because it increases annually and it has since the 90s when it went into place, it's now up to $12,000. So it's more than $11,000, okay? But um, not by much, but um, in any case, um, I do think that when you couple that with the insurance, um, it can make a difference for somebody um, running for council. Um, and um, who's to say um, if you are um, retired or have um, the means not to have to worry about this, who's to say that it does not make a material difference? Um, people can live um, with very little amounts of money if they really want to do something. Um, so, um, and then additionally, um, the workload is such that it, um, it can be very uneven. Um, and in this way, at least um, it's a compensation that um, is more regular rather than tied to meetings. You can be not meeting and still having lots of council work um, from the outside meetings that you have to um, do. So I'm of two minds on that one. Um, so I'm not sure where I'm sitting yet. I, I, I can still listen to more arguments one way or the other. Um, and then I'll wait to um, have more discussion about the third one in the context of the, the ballot um, and initiatives conversation that we're gonna have later. Adam and then Bob, Adam. You forgot me. Uh, Mirabai, you disappeared, so I'll add you in right after Bob. Sorry. I'm not sure your hand is down. Okay. Um, so I have a question before I make my comments. Uh, the way that the ballot language is written for the um, change in council pay, uh, when would that implement? So say we were to hold off until next year, would that happen immediately upon passing that that would change? I, I think that really is an important aspect of this as to whether it should go this year or next year, because it's pretty clear that there's a majority that are at least interested in doing it at some point. Anyone have an answer to that? 
Well, that's your, that's a drafting question, Adam. We're still at this conceptual stage here. Generally, we don't uh, have, in the past, when we've changed council compensation, we've had it apply to the next council. So our, our, the default for me would be to draft it so it applied to council members elected in 2021. And so it wouldn't apply to some until 2023. So if you put it off till 2021, that would back that up two years. Unless we want to make it in. Uh, I was, I was... I was thinking in the charter committee that we thought we wanted to have it go, if it went on this year, it would go into effect like January with the first paycheck of January, 2021. So that's the way that it came out of the charter committee um, is that it would, it would be an annual thing because that has to do with the way paychecks are distributed over the course of the year. So starting it close to January 1st with the first paycheck is what we were looking at. Kathy. Um, Rachel's absolutely right about how we talked about it. And Tom's right that you usually have increases. Well, you have to have increases applied to new council members that are elected after the uh, increase is approved. However, this one is not an increase. It's um, written so it's not increasing anybody's salary. So um, obviously I defer to Tom, but these are the types of things that you could just decide when you're actually looking at the ballot language. And I'm sorry to be confusing. These are the concepts that we're giving you. This is not the actual ballot language. We're looking for exactly what you're doing now of saying what specific things you would want to see in specific ballot language that we would prepare and present to you later. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to slot in Mirabai because she appeared and disappeared and then Bob, so Mirabai. I'm not done yet either, Sam. When oh, sorry. Nearby can go, but. No, no. No, go ahead, Adam. Okay. Um, so that being said, if we can make it so it applies immediately after the next, not this election, but the following, then I'd be on board with moving it a year. But if we can't do that, then I'd be more inclined to actually put it on this one. Um, just because Rachel makes a great point and is one of those people where this amount of money does make the difference and cleaning it up so it would be evenly distributed, that would be super helpful. So the insurance actually comes directly out of the paycheck rather than out of the bank account. That would be super helpful um, for anyone in that position. Um, so for me, that is the distinction that that would make is if we can make it so it applies immediately then I would put it on the next ballot. If we can't, then I would put it on this ballot. As for the Arts Commission, um, I can go either way on that. I, too, want to avoid ballot bloat if possible, but um, this seems like a pretty straightforward one, so I, I'm like Mary. I can go either way right now. Hey, you done? Yep, done. Thank you. Great. Mirabai. Um, I just wanted to say that I will fully support the arts um, ballot measure. Uh, again, they did write us a really wonderful letter and I think they need the help and something I think we should be supporting right now. Uh, as for the pay, I definitely hear what Mary's saying, but I'm fine with supporting it. I think it cleans it up. Um, I agree with what Rachel said on this topic. So, um, and, and you can see Adam was saying that for him, it makes a difference. So I'm fine with moving forward with that. Um. I'm going to agree with the people, I think it includes Mark and, and Sam and maybe some others, who were concerned about um, putting these forward this year in light of the situation we have. Um, so I, I would also be in favor of deferring, and particularly if, as Adam said, on the council compensation one, we could make that effective January 1, 2021. Uh, or 2022, I guess would be. Um, I'll, I'll speak to each one of them individually, however. I, I am sympathetic to the Arts Commission's workload, um, and I do want us to be responsive to them. I, I think what we should do on this one is sit down with the Arts Commission. I mean, we're, we got their letter in December, and it's now May, and a lot of things have happened since then. And I would sit down with the Arts Commission, or at least their chair, and find out um, how they would feel about deferring this until next year. I know they have a, um, they sometimes delegate work to subcommittees. I believe there's a public art subcommittee. Um, and I'm wondering if, if the issue is workload, if they could um, do some more of that delegation, um, uh, at least for the next year and a half until we could put this on a ballot uh, 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 
in 2021. So that's that would be the step forward or, or walk way forward that I would suggest is let's talk to the Arts Commission, see if they can do some delegation, see how uh, bummed out they'd be about not putting it on the ballot this year. And if, if they can live with that, I, that's where I would go. Um, with respect to council compensation, it seems like we were debating the wrong thing. We were debating about whether somebody could live on 11 or 12,000 a year or not. We're not talking about that because you get paid the same amount of money. It's just a timing question. I think if you look at your pay stubs, um, you'll see that actually, and this has been my experience now for five years on council, our meetings are actually front end loaded. We have more meetings in the first half of the year than we do in the second half of the year. As a matter of fact, if you look at your pay stub, you'll see that we're almost halfway to that 12,000. It's only the end of May. Um, and, um, and that's just because of we have more meetings in the first half of the year and we have more holidays in the second half of the year. Um, so if, if, the, if the issue is issue is not 12,000 or not 12,000, the issue is when do you get the 12,000? And it's actually relatively spread out with a little bit of front end loading to the first half of the year. Um, if the issue really comes down to the fact that some people have insurance payments that come due at a time when they we might be council may be taking a, a, a one or two week break and they don't have any compensation to offset um, that payment against I, I would fix the problem not through a charter amendment but work with our hr department to see if we could adjust the way that insurance payments are made maybe an exception can be made for council members where that insurance premium is deferred until such time as there is compensation to offset. If it's, it feels like we're, we're making a, a, a charter change for what it, it seems to be a relatively small problem that relates to timing that we can probably fix in another way. So I, I would agree with Mark and Sam and others who have said, let's not put either one of these on. These are both fine ballot measures and let's definitely uh, look at 2021, but I think it's a bad look for us to put things like this on the um, on the on the ballot if we don't have to. Thank you, Bob. So Rachel, your hands up. Is this a colloquy? Um, it is, and my hand was okay. also just up. Go ahead. <laughs> so, All right, go ahead. I, I mean, I, I'm I, I think it's a little bit. Okay, I would say it's a, a bit of a worse look for us not to put it on this year. Um, I think part of the reason we wouldn't be putting it on is because. Um, we know that other people are struggling to get signatures safely for the ballot um, and kind of don't want to put something on the ballot this year or put much on the ballot this year. Um, but again, I think as somebody who has lived paycheck to paycheck, it might be hard to understand, but it is important that you um, have a, you know, a similar amount of money coming in on a, a um, schedule that you can count on because you have rent due at a certain time and you have again this health insurance due so it is if you're um right on the edge financially it is it is meaningful to have things come in regularly and routinely um and i i don't think that um it's good enough to say we'll do it in 2021 because then people who are on the fence about running in 2021 have no idea whether they're going to have a reliable pay schedule and for somebody that um maybe on the fence and that makes a difference for it seems like an easy enough thing to do this year instead of next year and and have it be um for one thing have us send the message that we we do want you to run and we want you to be able to run and we see that this is something that we can um, ask the community for if they're interested in um and i don't know why we would shy away from it in terms of ballot bloat i would expect there will be a lot more next year because it's possible that um after we get the uh, electronic signatures going and in light of this year, there's gonna be more stuff on next year's ballot. So this seems like a cleaner year to do it as well. Great, well, <clears throat> I was trying to focus this on the first two. It seems like that was successful. Um, and I, I'm gonna do a straw poll here in a moment, but I'll have my say on these. Um, I agree that the art commission uh, change is probably a, a good idea. Um, I think it might be a good idea on other boards as well. Um, I, I just, I think we're gonna move forward with one or two big ticket items this year that are urgent and that do need to happen right now. I agree with Bob, I don't think the art commission thing needs to happen right now. So I'm gonna say the two things that others have said, I think it's a good idea. I don't know that we need to do it right now. Council compensation, it's, it's really just about smoothing it out. Um, I've lived paycheck to paycheck in this town before. Um, it, it's difficult. Um, I don't know that this would make much difference. This is a cash flow thing, whereas you know the, the size question I think is a far bigger one. If people are on the bubble about running for council, 
I don't know that this is going to make any difference. Whereas if the pay was twenty two thousand a year or twenty four thousand a year, it would make a huge difference in people's perspective about whether they want to run for council. So I would say again, I wouldn't put either one of these on this year. I think the emergency um, powers, to the extent that we go there, and potentially changing charter requirements around when signatures are due for petitions. I think those would be two big things. Ballot bloat's already here. It doesn't matter what we say about what might happen next year. We've got every, you know, this is a, an even year election. It's a presidential year. We're going to have like a full slate of, of tickets that we have to vote on up and down um, the candidate list. And then to bring forward a whole laundry list of things having to do with the city, many of which people won't start getting familiar with until right before the election, I think is we're going to waste bandwidth and we're going to waste people's attention span. And so I guess I think we should bring things forward this year, but only if there are things that we think need to be done in the next year. As far as council compensation, to get to Adam's question, because this doesn't change the salary level, I think we could do it in 2021 and have it apply to the first paychecks of 2022 when the new council is seated at that point. So, um, you know, typically the way it's worked when we changed anything around council compensation, which increased it, that couldn't go into effect until every council member who voted on it had to be either reelected or was out of office. And I think this one's different. And Tom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we could put this one on in November 2021 and have it start applying to paychecks um, for the new council. Is that correct? Yes, you could. Okay. That's a little. Yeah, may I colloquy on this? I we talked about that in the charter committee. We talked about um, doing it in 20. 20, so that wouldn't go into effect until 2022. And because of the way the pay periods align with the council elections, it wasn't working quite so well. And Cheryl might be able to explain this better. Um, in any case, I am starting to be persuaded that um, maybe this isn't the year to do this. Maybe we um, get the language set and um, do it in such a way that it would go into effect as um, Sam said, when everybody on this council has rolled out. I mean, actually I was surprised when the, the health insurance was available because that happened, I think before I got on council. So um, definitely everybody had rolled off. But anyway, um, I do think that it's not so easy to say to move it out to next year and have it go into effect 2022 because I think there's a way that things relate to. Um, I don't want to spend too much more time on, uh, debating this, um, but um, we could just move it for next year and have it go into effect after everybody's rolled off and it doesn't interfere with the way that the uh, paychecks work. Okay, so I've got... Mary's done. I've got two more hands up, Mark and Aaron. I would put out there that I'm ready to do a straw poll once we're ready. So Mark and Aaron, if you want your comments on these, let's go ahead and do it. And then let's do a straw poll because if we're all clear, we can just move ahead. Um, Mark and then Aaron. Mark. My very last word on the subject, um, I'm just reluctant to put the uh, A initiative on the ballot. Um, in a time of financial emergency and great hardship, uh, putting something on that is basically for our convenience, to me, is, is a, an unsatisfactory look. I would agree. You know. Aaron? Yeah, so I guess some things folks have uh, said convinced me on the deferring the payment thing, but I, so I liked Adam's idea um, about uh, putting it on next year and if it could go into effect immediately, I mean, maybe there'll be a little difficulty with the pay periods, but um, that seems like maybe a more reasonable way to go. Okay, so let's start from the top and let's do the art commission one. So um, this is just a straw poll. Um, Raise your hand so I can see it if you're interested in moving the uh, Art Commission initiative forward. So I see Mirabai, Aaron, Juni, so those, and Mary. So that's five, so that's a majority. So Arts Commission, we will move forward and deal with. 
I think that one's pretty straightforward. Um, and then council compensation, who would like to move that forward this year? Rachel, nearby, that's all I see. So sounds to me like we'll do the arts commission this year, but not the council compensation. Um, Tom, Kathy, do you need anything else from council on the arts commission? No, thank you. Um, that's all we need. Great. Okay, so we're done with the first two. Let's move on to um, changing the, the charter to allow emergency powers. Um, who would like to speak to this? Um, Bob? This is more of a request, because um, I've already said my piece on this. Um, Sam, you had mentioned something which I think is different than what's being proposed, which I'd like to talk about as well, but I want to make sure that we distinguish between what the Charter Committee proposed and what I think you're proposing, if you see the difference. Okay, so uh, describe what you think I was proposing. I think you were proposing, a, 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 as I understood it, as a cleanup to the Charter um, related to um, uh, potential inconsistencies between uh, our charter and state law, which I would fully support. Um, so if that's what we're talking about, I would like to talk about that. Um, I think what the charter committee has proposed is, is allowing council to um, waive charter provisions in the event of an, emer an emergency. And that's the one I would be opposed to, because again, uh, I, well, let, let me just frame it in the form of a question. What's the water issue, Tom, and, and is it fixable? Uh, we, well, it's an, it's an issue we're avoiding right now. The charter says that you can't give free water to anyone. We okay. have not done any water cutoffs, and okay. there are people not paying their bills. Okay, so we, administratively, we've kind of gotten gotten around that by simply not uh, not cutting people off if they don't pay their bills. Yes, right. We're not giving free water. We're just not charging for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're accruing debt, right? So, I mean, this is kind of like the rent holiday versus rent postponement question. So, Bob, I'm just going to jump in here and say my point about the um, deadlines, the potential inconsistency in, in deadlines for uh, submitting signatures was separate from the emergency um, stuff proposed by the Charter Committee. So I want that to be a separate bullet that comes after this discussion. Yeah, I agree with that completely. So I, I just want to make sure we were distinguishing between those two. Um, and, and so if, if, if the issue, the primary the, the primary thing that people can think of that we need to address in a, an emergency that the Charter pre prevents us from dealing with an emergency that relates to that emergency is no free water, then let's just put, let's just put a Charter Amendment on that says we can provide free water either in the, in the event of an emergency or otherwise. I, I don't really care about that. That's the only one I've heard so far that relates to the emergency that we can't waive, although we've handled it elegantly administratively already. But but if, if that's what people are really have heartburn about is free water, then let's put a charter amendment on that says we can provide free water. Okay, I see no hands up. Um, Mark? Yeah, my, I actually have a question, which is, um, how would this be fleshed, I'm sorry, fleshed out? What would be the process by which we would get a draft amendment that actually uh, relates to the specific issues that we are talking about? So we would bring forward a, a first reading ordinance with a memorandum that explained it. We'd take into account the comments that council members have made tonight and shape it. And sometimes we'll put together two or three options for council to consider either as different ordinances or uh, with potential amendments. And so what I've heard is that council members want to clearly define what the trigger for this would be, what the boundaries are, what the limitations are, what could be done and what couldn't be done. And so we draft something like that and get it to you probably, probably the first meeting after the break is first reading, maybe the, first, the last meeting before the break. Okay. Um, Mark, any other questions? No, but I guess I'd be wondering if you could get it to us in informally a little bit earlier than that. And this is a very consequential proposal, and yeah, yeah, we really need to understand exactly what is being suggested and what the scope of it is and how it would be implemented. Um, and the more time we have to actually absorb it and think about it, uh, I think we will be better off. I mean, this well, is as I consequential an amendment as I can think of. The last meeting before the break would probably be as early as we could do it. 
And that, that's usually the, that's aggressive for us for doing ballot measures. Remember you have all of, you have the, all of July and August to, to refine it. So uh, getting it much earlier than that, we could probably do it, but that would be challenging. Great, and I've got Junie and Mary. Junie. I think part, can you hear me? I think part of my question was already answered, um, but I think my understanding of number three is that we want something that is slightly more generic, that is not too specialized or constrained, because if we just said, if we created a free water one, then it would just be for water. Then when we have an emergency situation, we would be exactly where we were a few weeks ago when we were wondering what do we do because we couldn't have remote city council meetings. So I think from what I'm hearing best, as Tom mentioned, is to have something that is power of an individual or of a group. Because when you just unleash people and you just have them, they have as much power as possible, they just can come up with any kind of emergency. They can call it an emergency themselves. So that's not what we want. We want more constraint, but at the same time, we want some level of flexibility so that we can get our work done. Um, I do still have a question to Tom about what is a supermajority. I still am lost on that. We were thinking two thirds or six council members. Why, oh, is it because it's an emergency you want it to be six? To make it a little harder to pass. Okay, yeah, fair, thank you. The super majorities exist today, right, Tom? We have yeah. to have a super majority to pass something on emergency, like yeah. on second reading. So, Junie, a super majority is already codified in certain parts of our ordinances. Yeah. Okay. Mary? And so is unanimity. And so I, you know, to put a further um, constraint on it, I would propose making it unanimous. And um, and Junie has said earlier that um, further constrain it is put make it um, that it's also a national emergency, so that further constrains it. Um, I do see um, value in in doing this, and I think the guardrails are going to be important. Um, so the three guardrails are, I see are making it unanimous, making it in the context of a national emergency and putting a very um, short and finite amount of time on it. Um, so those are, those are the three big guardrails that I see. And, um, and then to Mark's question about getting it to us prior to the break, um, I, We've had other ballot initiatives come before us that have needed thought. And um, I've always found that the time that we have, July and August, before we finally settle on something in September has been adequate amount of time. Um, and, and then just, I don't know how much thinking you wanna do about this on our recess. Thank you, Mary. Rachel? Um, I agree with what much of what Mary just said. I think unanimous might be one too many because what if you just get like a um, a holdout who's I don't know irrational or or just I think eight out of nine would be like leave that little bit of wiggle room. I can understand how six doesn't feel much better than five, but unanimous I don't know I, that sounds steep. Okay, so I'll jump in here. Um, I agree with Rachel. I think unanimous sounds steep. Um, super majority with nine is six people. So I think three quarters would maybe get us to where we want to keep in mind that you won't always have nine members, right? So you need to set it as a fraction of the quorum, whatever that needs to be. Is that right, Tom? If, if we had a two thirds or three quarters, it's of the members who are present in a quorum. Yeah, that's the way it's written in the emergency. Right. And so just to, so five times nine, 
Yeah, so the way to get to seven, um, as just for instance, if we wanted to have 75% or three quarters um, for a nine person council, that would mean seven members would have to vote for it. I, I think unanimous is, you know, that leaves you vulnerable to one curmudgeon um, who is just not gonna go there because of some ideological reason. And I think even with two, that can be a threat. If you had one person missing from the council meeting, it's basically going to have to be unanimous um, minus one. Uh, so I guess from my standpoint, if we want to put that guardrail on, which I agree with, I would do a three quarter majority as a suggestion between unanimous and, and six person for two thirds. Um, I think we have to be real careful with this one. I agree with Bob in the following sense. He did an interesting thought experiment about what is it we couldn't do in the flood? Or what is it that we couldn't do um, this year um, for the respective crises that we've had? I think one of the, the temptations that we would, a council in that situation um, would find themselves in is to undedicate dedicated funds. Okay, so I think one of the justifications I heard for the emergency powers would be to be able to undedicate funds like open space and transportation and the library and everything just magically goes into the, the big <laughs> collective pot outside of utilities. And then the council could then decide along with staff how to allocate the monies that were dedicated for open space in the charter. And then we would come back and say, oh, we need the emergency powers. We're gonna redo it um, as far as the dedicated funds go. I think if we want to undedicate funds, we need to undedicate funds and it shouldn't be part of emergency powers. You know, I think if, if we can convince voters it's a bad idea and, you know, we don't want you knowing for sure that what you vote on in a particular ballot initiative is binding throughout the, the terms of the tax you just approved, that's fine, but I don't think we should do that part through emergency powers. So I'm just saying that for me, an important guardrail would be that the emergency powers don't let a future council raid the piggy bank of any dedicated funds that are out there. I know that lots of people hate dedicated funds and that's fine. Um, that's an argument that could be had on its own merits, but I'd like it not to be part of uh, emergency measures. I'm gonna point out a, a bit of trivia here. Um, somewhere in the charter, as I was reading it in the last few days, it says that the mayor can, council can designate the mayor to take command of the police force um, from the city manager in an emergency. I think that's a terrible idea, I'm speaking as a mayor. <laughs> and I, as we go through whatever we do for emergency, I would also like us to review what's in there right now in the charter and make sure that we don't have any emergency provisions that we don't think should remain in there. Um, and then, you know, finally, I think this one, is good to pass now or at least put on the ballot now because we're thinking about it real time. We're having to deal with this issue. So, you know, the water thing, as Tom says, I think we've come up with a workaround for that. Um, but keep in mind that people are accumulating debt. So nobody's getting free water. We're just not making them pay when they may not have money. But that bill will come due. So I don't know if free water means that um, they don't have to pay for a period, which is one way that water is free, but they owe the money. Um, or if we're intending to just give people water, I think the reason that that's probably in the charter is there were probably fights about that. Like there's always fights about water in the West. So um, I would support moving forward with an emergency um, measure to go in the charter. But I think like Mark, um, I, I find this very consequential. I think we have to be really careful about um, how we go about it. Next, I have Aaron and then Rachel. Aaron, you're on mute. 
there I go again. That's, and I never do that. Really, I never do that. Okay, so um, really quickly, uh, Sam, I thought those were great points. Um, and I, I was going to go to the seven uh, major person majority as well. So and I think doing three quarters, doing it as a three quarters vote would make sense. Um, and I thought Junie's points were great about that. We're, we're dealing with, we, we'd be granting future councils the ability to have some flexibility to deal with unforeseen um, things that we're not, we're not sure what they are, right? Who, I don't think we would have, anyway. So um, can I just ask one separate question while we're talking about ballot measures um, in terms of dedicated funds, Jane or, or somebody else, have we at all considered like that we might need to or want to do like a, a one-year pause on on uh, on some dedicated funds, like consider putting on the ballot something that would um, uh, give us a little bit more flexibility for a short period of time to weather this financial crisis? So the Financial Strategy Committee um, discussed this very briefly, I think at their last meeting um, and my memory is that they were not going to bring it forward. Um, and there, I think there's further sort of thinking behind the scenes about whether it's appropriate or not to do that. So it's actually kind of a discussion that maybe council might want to have. I'm going to just say my personal view, which is that um, only undedicating funds for a short period of time is probably not going to be as effective as we would want it to be. Um, and I, I believe that our residents voted for dedicated funds for a good reason. And so it might be a difficult um, position to put the council in to say, let's undedicate funds for um, such a short period. I, I don't know, it, it really is a political question for the council to take up. Okay, okay, thanks for that. And I don't want to start a big debate over this tonight. I guess I would just say that uh, it would be useful to know if the financial analysis by the staff uh, felt like uh, they were falling into a crater uh, and that would be a rope to get us from, prevent that from happening. So. Not that we would do it, but just it would be helpful to know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So Rachel, Mark, and Bob. Rachel, you're up. Real quick, I like your 75% idea. That sounds like a good compromise. And then in terms of um, the guardrail around a state of emergency, I'd be um, cautious about tying it to a nationally declared state of emergency because I don't know that that would cover things like the flood that we had in 2013. So I would hope that there's a more local emergency option um, I would think the state of Col I just don't know how that works, but the state of Colorado, I assume, declared a state of emergency during the 2013 flood and the federal government did not. Um, so whatever we need to do to tie it to, to localized emergencies that would be a legitimate outside of Boulder City Council declaring something is what I would hope it was tethered to. Great, and I'm gonna colloquy on that, Rachel. I, I meant to bring that up, thank you. That's a very good point. Um, <clears throat> I believe that when the state does disaster declarations, like for the 2013 floods, it does it by county. And so I would just ask that staff take a look at that. And uh, to Mary's point about, you know, it needs to be in the context of a larger emergency. Um, I, would, I would support if the state declares an emergency in Boulder County, that we would then be able to proceed with the emergency measures, plus any other requirements that might be there. So um, I agree with what Rachel just said that maybe it doesn't need to be national, but if maybe we can have this kick in if the state declares an emergency in Boulder County and we're affected, then um, maybe that's a trigger. Then next I have Mark and Bob. Um, just one comment uh, about what Jane said. It's my recollection, or it's not my recollection, that the uh, Financial Strategies Committee had rejected the concept of undedicating funds for a small period of time. It's that we simply had not fully gone through the analysis and it's probably something we ought to do. Um, but I do not recall that we, as a group, said we don't pursue that particular uh, alternative. I also want to weigh in on, on 
uh, what Rachel and Sam said, a, uh, a local emergency can be as valid an emergency as a national one, and we need to have the flexibility to take advantage of something that, you know, a, a more local declaration and be able to act accordingly. Great. Yeah, I'm going to jump in and thank Mark for that. I, I, I may be misremembered. I know we talked about it, but your memory is probably better than mine, Mark, about that well, conversation. Don't, don't count on that. <laughs> yeah. No, and, I, and um, I remember when Jane brought it up, I did remember having that conversation, but I also remembered um, when Mark, you brought it up, um, that we didn't really come to a conclusion. And what it was, was a short discussion under the, the financial sustainability piece of it and what things can we do um, to make our um, finances more sustainable and there's the whole do, do we do different kinds of taxes and we had a conversation about head taxes um, and then we do we you know undedicate funds um, but that was the extent of the conversation there's more work to be done for sure great thank you all uh, Bob you're next yeah, um, well, it sounds like there's maybe a majority for going forward here. I'm still opposed. I would just observe for those of you who do want to go forward that the, the two exceptions that have been teed up cannot possibly be the limit of the exceptions. I just went through the charter really, really quick. There's hundreds of provisions in the charter, literally hundreds. There's 13 articles and each one has dozens of provisions in it. And I'll give you some examples of some of the things we'd be able to suspend um, unless we have an exception for them. We would be able to change the term of council members. We'd be able to suspend elections. We'd be able to enter into franchises or terminate franchises. We'd be able to op uh, abolish boards and commissions. We'd be able to suspend um, Article 13 uh, relating to human rights. And we would even actually could even change the name of the city because that's an article one and we could change the name of the city because um, that's would be within our power. So I would suggest that if you're going to go down this path, you're going to have lists of dozens and dozens and dozens of exceptions with where it's going to say we can we can change the charter um, except for the following dozens of things. And so I think your list is going to be super, super long. So rather than trying to um, give us blanket authority to suspend the charter, whether it's on seven votes or some other number, <clears throat> and then having lists of dozens of things that we can't change because we don't want to give ourselves that much power, I suggest we tackle the problems that we do have rather than tackling all the problems and then trying to accept out uh, the list. Because I, I think if you go and read through the charter, you're going to find there's lots and lots of stuff in the charter that our voters are not going to allow us uh, even an emergency suspend. So that's that's my final piece on this. I, I, I continue to be opposed. I'm Mark. Bob, I have a different view, which is not that we would grant uh, generalized power to suspend the charter with exceptions where we can't, but to have a very narrow and limited group of, of items where we could and, and specifically enumerate those and circumscribe them so that everybody understands exactly what the nature of that emergency power is, how long it can be exercised, and what are the conditions under which it can be exercised. Um, and and I, so I would take it differently. I would start from the particular and not deal with the general at all. So I'm going to jump in here. I agree with Mark 100%. <clears throat> I think this should be a set of powers that are enumerated, as Mark said, that, that a council can affect. Um, and they need to be things which would have an impact on a, an emergency. And I think going through the exercise having staff go through the exercise of what powers that are granted by the charter could be things that council um, would have more flexibility if they could alter. So if there's certain provisions which are in the charter that are restrictive that staff can point to that could have an implication during a flood, a pandemic, a fire, a nuclear war, you know, you name the things that were, you know, the, the half dozen things that we might have to cope with that are major, um, what elements of the charter, if suspended, would give council and the city manager the wherewithal to get done what needed done? So I'm not sure I would vote 
to put this on the ballot yet because I don't know what it's going to say. But I agree that if it's going to be something that I could support, it's going to have to enumerate particular powers of council and not just say that council can suspend with a vote of seven every provision in the charter. So I see no more hands. I think the question before us on this issue is do we want to move forward with the ability for council to waive some or all charter requirements during an emergency? Um, so I'd just like a show of hands for who'd like staff to do more work on this, and I'm sure we'll have more conversations. So I'm going to support it. I think we've got everyone except for Bob. So I think that's eight people who want to move forward. So let's move forward with it, Tom. And Kathy, do you have what you need from council as far as where the areas of concern are with this one? Yes. Okay. Um, I do, and I think it will, you'll probably be getting several options for this, since, uh, but you've given us a lot of material that's really helpful. Okay. Could we have a quick discussion about, or, or maybe a show of hands about whether, um, whether the other council members agree with what you and Mark said, rather than a waiver of all provisions, except those enumerated, that we would only be able to affect those things that are enumerated because it's a. I, I want to be sensitive to staff because that's those are two different, completely different work work streams. And if staff is going to be preparing a list of things that we could waive, that's a different exercise than a list of things we couldn't waive. So I guess the question is, do, does the rest of council agree with Mark and Sam on that point? Great. So I, I'm going to put a pause on that, and we'll come back to that. Rachel has her hand up. Go ahead, Rachel. Well, the, it was on that. I was just going to respond to Bob. Good. Go ahead. I think I would need to know what what we're looking at um, because I think it's got to be broad enough to include these emergencies that we cannot see. You know, is it is it possible that there could be some way that changing the name of our city would respond to a uh, crisis? I can't imagine it. Like, I guess if if uh, there was like an alien invasion and they were targeting cities named Boulder, then you would change the name of the city, right? <laughs> so maybe that's an option. Seems very far-fetched. Um, but I don't know that I want to limit us to think we have no idea what we're looking at. So I'd, I'd be really curious what the what these lists look like because I, it, it's kind of pointless if we think we know we're responding to the emergencies that we had today and uh, six years ago, but we don't... I don't know, I, I, it's gotta be broad enough to be helpful. Great. Thank you, Rachel. The, the journalists in the audience, thank you as well. Aaron? <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Rachel there. I, the way that I would approach this would be to have uh, real strict time limits around any actions that were taken um, rather than to circumscribe it. Um, because I, I think you could have a crisis in the future that we can't even imagine and you, you're not sure what would come in handy and be necessary. Okay, so I think we have uh, a bifurcation here that Bob has pointed out, which is um, do we want staff to approach this as enumerating specific areas of the charter that could be suspended or changed? Or do we want council to make it general and try and put guardrails like Aaron suggested with time? So, and I think that's a fundamental bifurcation. Um, hang on, I'm gonna check my chat box here briefly to see. Oh, Kathy, you had at one point raised your hand. Have you had a chance to say what you're gonna say? Um, I, I think we're fine. You've given enough guidance. I was thinking of the elections issue that if this pandemic would have happened at a different time that nationally elections may have been changed and as one of the enumerated items. I see. Okay, so I think we're going to go enumerated versus non-enumerated because I think that's, a, as Bob said, that's a totally different set of tasks for staff to do. So one is make general provisions saying council can suspend any any of the provisions of the charter, but there's some other guardrails. And I don't know what those are, things you can't suspend and time limits and so on. Another approach to this is what Mark had suggested, which is enumerate specifically the areas of charter that could be suspended or altered during an emergency. So we'll call one carte blanche which is um, guardrails on being able to suspend anything. Another one is enumerated 
areas of the charter that could be affected by an emergency declaration. So just for a straw poll, who leans more towards the first one, which is not enumerated specifically, but a general emergency power of charter, uh, of council rather, to suspend charter provisions in an emergency? Who favors that as the going in approach? I see Rachel's hand up, Aaron's hand up, Junie's hand up. So I see three. If this is to go forward, who would prefer that we um, enumerate the specific areas of charter that could be suspended in an emergency? So I see one, two, three, four, five, six. So I think it's pretty clear that a majority would like to go with enumerated. So that's just instruction to staff when you're putting the options together. I think it's more like look at which areas could um, council modify or suspend. And I have hands up here. I've got Aaron. No, Aaron's no longer. Okay, so I think we've given clear direction on this one to um, <clears throat> move forward with options around emergency powers of council to suspend the charter, but only specific areas within the charter. Is that clear to staff? Yes, thank you. Okay, good enough. So I think we're through what has been brought forward. Cheryl, I noticed that you have more slides in the deck. Um, yeah, just a couple. Sure, just a couple more. Um, quick, I'll go quickly. So um, when we look at other tax or other ballot items that co could potentially be put on the ballot, like I mentioned before, staff is not recommending any items. Typically, these are financial in nature. Um, they could be something else, too, depending on um, what we are working on at the time. But just a reminder about our sales tax and property tax, our current rates, and what additional revenue would come if, if the rates were to be increased or decreased. And looking ahead uh, to the next several years for our expiring taxes, we have next year our community culture and safety tax is going to be expiring. And then in 2022, the utility occupation tax for both uh, energy strategy and the general fund followed shortly afterwards in March of 23, the, the climate action tax. And then in December of 24, there's a 0.15 general fund tax. So that's it for actually quite a while of taxes expiring. And then this is just kind of a catch-all question. If there's any other issues other than what Tom uh, will be discussing next that you would like to consider uh, bringing forward for the 2020 ballot. Okay, so I will jump in there and say the answer is yes on my part. Do you want to continue with the last two timelines? Sure. And then we'll um, come back to that. Sounds good. So as Tom discussed, June and July is the time period that uh, he and his team will go back and draft potential ballot items. There are times that he'll come back to you before the break. If it's it's a simpler issue, perhaps the Arts Commission, I don't want to speak for Tom, but that does occur. But typically, um, he will come back end of July, early August. We do have three meetings starting in August that we can discuss the ballot items, including any needed public hearings. And then the final meeting that we could use to discuss ballot items is September 1st. After that, um, it's, it's really too late. The clerk needs to submit by the end of that week um, to have these items placed on the November ballot. And that's all I have, thank you. Great, thank you, Cheryl. This was a really well-organized um, presentation to help us walk through the issues. So the, the remaining question before us is, are there any other ballot items that we would like to talk about? Um, I previewed that I'm interested in hearing from uh, Tom and staff about potential conflicts between the state rules governing when signatures to um, on a petition to change the charter need to be turned in versus our Boulder Charter rules about when such signatures need to be turned in. We've had a few members of uh, the public raise this 
for us. And Tom, I think you've been giving advice to um, the groups carrying petitions right now that if it's a charter amendment, they'd be safer getting it in earlier um, per the state deadline, but it's possible that we would accept them through our charter deadline. So do you wanna speak about that a bit? Sure, Sam, I have a presentation if you wanna move on to the next item. So the next item, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the next item is the um, the governor's order. Is that right? I rolled, I rolled it all in together, Sam. Perfect. Yeah, if you want to start with your presentation, I think that'd be helpful. Great, thank you. There it is. There it is. Right. Take a second for me to advance it. There it goes. This is a, just a brief overview of Governor Polis's order. Uh, it applies only to state initiatives. I saw an email over the weekend that said uh, my memo wasn't clear. I read the memo. I have two sentences in there that says it only applies to state initiatives. It doesn't apply to municipal uh, initiatives. Exactly. Uh, uh, the, to, the, second, it suspends some of the, the following provisions as applicable to state initiatives. Provisions related to the form of the initiatives, the six month filing requirement, and requirement for signing in the, single, in the circulator's presence. It extends the deadline for submission, and then it requires the Secretary of State to issue rules. My original charge was to describe those rules. Those rules have not been published yet. I'm not aware of when they'll be published, but we have not seen them. So I do not know what the Secretary of State is going to do in terms of, of allowing email or mailed signatures. So that's my overview of Governor Polis's order, uh, which is in effect, but has to be implemented through Secretary of State's rules, which are not out yet. So I wanted to turn to some of the comments that we've seen, uh, basically from one person I've seen them from, but uh, I, I kind of want to go over where the city's power comes from and, and, and the, the extent that there's a conflict, how it arises. Um, so Article uh, 20, Section 6 of the, the Constitution is part of the Home Rule uh, provisions of the Charter, of the Constitution. And you can see it, it gives the Home Rule cities the power to amend, add, or replace the Charter provisions. Uh, it says that chartered ordinances may pursuant to, to supersede within the territorial limits of the jurisdiction of the city, any law or state in conflict therewith. So, so for on matters of local concern, city law overcomes state law. And it also says all matters pertaining to municipal elections in such city or town um, and submitted on the charter are matters of local concern. So uh, elections are defined in the Constitution as matters of local concern. So going on, I got an email over the weekend that said, section nine supersedes section six. That's not true. The language in section nine that the person was relying on says, notwithstanding any provision of section four, five, and six of, the, of this article, to the contrary, the registered electors of, any, of each city and county city, in town of this state are hereby vested with the power to adopt, amend, and repeal a home rule charter. This section supports the language in section six, giving home rule cities the ability to determine how their charters are remembered or are amended. There's also a provision in section nine that says, the General Assembly shall provide by statute procedures under which the registered electors of any proposed or existing city or county, city or town may adopt, amend, and repeal a municipal home rule charter. Now, notice the Constitution uses the word may and not shall. The state law is intended as guidance. Uh, section 31-1-102, which is at the beginning of Title 31, which governs, which is all the municipal provisions in the, in the, in the state code. It is the intent of the General Assembly that the provisions of this title shall apply to home new municipalities, except insofar as superseded by charter or ordinance passed pursuant to such charter. So what the state was saying when they adopted those provisions, which are in Title 31, Section 2, Article 2, uh, is that you can use these if you don't have anything yourself. And the fact is the city has some things ourselves. We still have some level of confusion, however, because there's a question of what governs what in our charter. The charter was amended in 2017 to clear all of this up, and then the same person who is raising questions now 
advocated for the council to undo the changes that had been made by the voters in 2017. And we had another election in 2018 to revise the charter again and put in these provisions, which now are being suggested are ambiguous. Um, I don't know that they are, but let me go through them. So charter section, so we'll start with charter section 37, which I don't have listed here. Charter section 37 says that uh, initiative petitions and charter amendments shall be called initiatives throughout the charter. So anytime the, word, the charter uses the word initiatives, it includes both people's ordinances and charter amendments. They're not separated in a charter, and charter section 37 says that expressly. They are treated the same. All right, so for initiative petitions, Charter Section 38 says 10% of the average of the last two municipal elections. Charter amendments, the staff has decided on our own to rely on state law to use 5% of the registered voters. We could have said rely on the charter, but we didn't. We gave guidance early on that 5% of the registered voter was required. An issue came up about a provision in state law that requires double the number of signatures if you want a special election. The argument was, well, then you need double the number of signatures to make a charter amendment because this is a special municipal election year. The charter, our charter, uses special election to mean an election held other than in November. It uses special municipal election to mean elections that are not the municipal election held in odd number of years. There's a distinction there. We used to have a provision in the charter that allowed petitioners to force the council to have a special election other than in November by getting more signatures. The voters removed that provision in 2017. What the argument that's being made is that we should reinstate it, but reinstate it as to even year elections, even elections in even years, which was never the intent and doesn't comport with charter language. Tom, can I interrupt briefly with a question? Um, your second bullet, you said that um, staff chose to use the requirements of the Colorado revised statutes to advise people they would only need 5% of the registered voters rather than 10% of the average of the last two municipal elections. So why did staff choose the CRS rather than the older charter? I'm not sure, Steve. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Sam. The the we we probably should have used the the charter provision, but we decided for some reason to use the the provision in state law. I think there was an argument at the time. The, the actually five percent of the registered voters is a slightly bigger by about six seven hundred signatures than the ten percent of the average of the last two municipal elections. So this actually imposes a higher requirement. Our general policy is to make it easier for initial gatherers, but this is what we've told them. And my re strong recommendation is that council not change the rules midstream, that we establish the rules by uh, with a, a, a memo from the clerk at the beginning of the election cycle, and we should really stick with that interpretation. If council wants to clean these things up, we should do it, but do it for the next election, not for this one. Okay, thank you. Deadlines, initiative petitions are due 150 days before the election. That's Charter Section 89. Charter amendments, again, we gave the advice that they would do 90 days before the election. This is based on CRS Section 31-210-1 sub 3. Um, we could have said 150 days before the election. We didn't, and people have relied on that to their detriment. So again, I wouldn't recommend changing it. We could clarify that, um, that charter amendments are governed as the charter says, by the charter provisions, by nothing else. Um, the charter provides the petition signature gatherers shall have 180 days to gather signatures. That's also in charter section 39. Uh, state law limits charter amendments to gathering for 90 days after the statement of intent is filed. We could have applied that. We chose not to, and we advised the, uh, the committees that they had 180 days from the, to, to gather signatures, and that therefore they, they would have, the other deadlines would apply. Okay, so help me out, Tom. I'm just trying to track. Yeah. So why is it that you were picking and choosing, or staff, whoever did this, was picking and choosing between Charter Section 39, which is 150 days before the election they're due, and CRS? So again, I'm trying to figure out if your argument is, if I followed correctly, that the charter trumps the state for home rule cities, 
and we've been, you know, we're not silent on these issues in the charter. We're actually stating deadlines and, and, and petition signature amounts. Then how come we're toggling back and forth between the charter requirement and the CRS? Yeah, I, I, Sam, I don't think we should have done that, but that's what we did. Okay, so is it the case that going forward, if we give staff directions to use the charter as the only document that we're, you know, following, and that we believe the justification for that is everything that you put at the beginning of the presentation, which is home rule charters have the ability to set these things. And we've done charter cleanups twice in the last, you know, in 17 and 18. Then can't we just from here on out give instructions to petition committees that the charter is the governing document and only numbers we give them and signatures and deadlines are what is in the charter. If we yes. did that, do you feel like we'd be protected under our standing as a home rule city? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that you need to amend, amend the charter. You could amend the charter to make it that absolutely clear, but it, it, from the way I read the charter, it's clear. Okay, so I'll take that under advisement, but this seems to be what we're looking at now is the, the point of contention, the 90 days before election or 150 days before the election. That was some guidance that staff was giving to uh, the, the groups that are organizing around amendments, whether yep. the ordinances, whether their charter, um, these were staff recommendations. And so one thing we need to get crystal clear on is what the staff should recommend. The second question then is, do we need to make it more crystal clear in charter? Yes, and I, I should add that those are published on our website. There are documents that you can go to that say guidelines for initiative petitions or guidelines for charter amendments that were published months ago. So they were published months ago. Did they have, were they picking and choosing between the charter and the CRS deadlines? Yes. Okay, thank you. At least for charter amendments, for, for, for non-charter petitions, they, they're pretty consistent with the charter. Great, and I just want to check in. I've got two hands raised, Mary and Mark. Do you guys have questions about where we are in the process? So Mary? Yes, um, so Tom, my question is, um, you're saying that we can, or Sam's suggestion was that council give direction to follow the charter. Yes. And I would presume that in order to do so, you would then add those to the council rules? Is that where that would go? Not necessarily. I mean, we could put in an ordinance. Um, I, I think that we've all learned a lot through this process. This is the first time we've really had to apply these charter changes. And it's been a kind of a trying cir circumstance. I think that we just changed the guidance that comes from the clerk's office. But if you wanted to be absolutely certain, we could put it in an ordinance. Because this is the method through which council interprets the charter. Um, well, it seems to me that if there's any potential for, uh, it, there's obviously potential for toggling back and forth between the CRS and the charter. And um, in order to clarify that, it seems to me like we um, either do it one of three ways is we change the charter, we do it by ordinance, or we change the guidance that the city clerk's office provides. Yes. Um, and I would think that um, the 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 two former ones, and this is to my colleagues, I would think that the either changing the charter or putting it in ordinance would provide more crystal clear clarification than um, the situation that we have at hand, which is we're going to have a change in city clerks. And so just by virtue of a change in city clerks, the guidance could change through interpretation. So the toggling could happen again. So it seems to me we either change the charter or we do it by ordinance. And, and could I clarify one thing? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tom. So, so one of the things that one advocate has said is that we should follow state law for charter amendments and not have it in the charter. You could do that too. That, in my view, would require a charter amendment, but it's a relative, if council chose to say, just rely on state law for charter amendments, that's something you could do as well. Hey, Mary, are you done? I am done. Great, thanks. Um, Mark and then Rachel and then Mirabai. 
A quick question, Tom. Is, is there a legal jeopardy to any of the actions taken um, by staff to make a selection, or does Sam says toggle between uh, state and charter provisions in a discretionary fashion? I, I think there would be more risk if we changed our advice after people relied on it. I'm not suggesting we, we, we should do that. I'm just asking if somebody got it in their head that they wanted to. Well, yeah, we've been sued before over uh, initiative things. They, they often to be, they're often very contentious. I think we're on pretty strong ground with what we've done and we can articulate a rational basis for doing it. It doesn't mean someone won't sue us. Okay. Yes, I got Rachel on nearby, Rachel. Just kind of a broader question for Tom, and maybe doesn't need to be answered tonight. But um, our our charter and procedures sound like a, a pain in the butt to me, and difficult to understand for a lot of people. <laughs> and I don't know how we got here or what the um, yeah the genesis is for for the convoluted situation that we're in. But I wonder is there are there specific things that are really helpful to community members that we have under our home rule for elections um, that we would want to salvage and keep and then as you suggested i think just revert to state law for some things such as charter amendments and is that you know do we want to look a little broader because this is all it all sounds um maybe more convoluted than it needs to be so yeah. i wonder what's in it for for bolder community members especially bearing in mind that um, usually people who are, are direct petitioning are trying to um, enact something that is, you know, not necessarily the will of the majority of council, and it, it, that's the, the benefit of direct democracy. And so how, how um, arcane do we need to make it? Do you need to be a lawyer to be able to decipher some of these things? Well, you know, one of the things I've talked about is the guidance that the clerk gives to the community. Those are, I, I think those documents are pretty good and they break it down step by step so you don't have to figure out, go to the charter and figure out what the rules are. We tell you what the rules are. And, and so doing that is helpful. I wasn't suggesting that we rely on state law. I don't think that's a good idea. I think that how we do this in Boulder is important to Boulder and that the state has to deal with all sorts of cities of all sorts of sizes throughout the state. And so a lot of their guidance is really intended for much smaller cities than Boulder. Uh, we have a, a very sophisticated electorate here. Uh, and I, I think that it's important for us to exercise our home rule authority. So I would not recommend relying on state law. That's an option if that's something that you want. And there is one very vocal person in the community who suggests that what that's what we should do. Uh, in all cases, but I, I leave it up to you which way you want to go. I didn't mean for all cases. I just meant like, are there, are there, you know, maintaining home rule? Are there certain things that you would say, and then can you default to state law for? I thought you were suggesting charter amendments. No, th that's possible, but I wouldn't re recommend. I think, I, in, in, if in my perfect world, we relied on the charter for everything, and it was absolutely clear that we were doing that. Um, as you know, Rachel, um, charter amendments and initiative petitions are inherently political, um, and they tend to be hotly contested uh, from the very outset. So having clear rules is really important. And um, I hate for staff to be in the position of having to favor one side over the other in an initiative process. We try to stay absolutely neutral uh, because that's our job. So the clearer the rules, the better for me and relying on our charter rather than state law gives us control over what the rules say and what, how clear they are. And nearby. So Tom, to kind of colloquy off all this, um, you kind of just answered part of my question with saying that you think we should stick to the charter on this, but I guess so I was of the mind of switching over the one section where we seem to be having this issue from the resident um, talking about the days from when the petition is set to when uh, they have to turn it in or when the petition's in initiated, to when they have to turn it in and have that match state law, because to me that's a pretty clear um, guideline no matter what. Uh, and it doesn't leave any areas for any gray areas, I guess. And so 
is if we did just that section and matched our charter to state law and that, would, would you support that? And if not, well, it, it, it's not for me to support or not. I mean, the, the, the discussion there would be, you're cutting down the number of days people have to gather signatures and you're encouraging people to wait. It's generally in our interest to have people get these things out there early so we can work on them. Uh, if you look at the example of two charter amendments we have before us, this would tend to punish the bedrooms or for people, folks who got theirs out way early and encourage the mayoral, the next mayoral election folks who got theirs out late because they would have a different deadlines and one would be much earlier than the other. Um, so it, it would be your choice if you wanted to go with state law on that. I, I'm not sure I understand why the state did that. Um, our charter has always said you have six months to gather signatures. And so um, cutting it to three is a material change for folks. So I, we, we could certainly draft something like that if, you, if council is interested. Uh, I, I just encourage you to think about the implications of, of doing that. Okay, so that, I mean, I, I understand the logic there. So ours is much more lenient. Um, I, guess, I guess I'm just confused then why, I guess the problem is, is being you know on the charter committee having you say one side and then getting so many emails stating that the other side and that the charter doesn't support it. And it's just going back and forth. And so being on a council, you know, and not having a law degree, this is getting really, really confusing to be honest. So I, I'll just, I guess, I don't know if the rest of council received as much as the charter committee received and, and whatnot, but it would be very nice to get this figured out because there's a lot to deal with. So I, I can't discourage people from contacting the council. That's their role. Um, the person who's advocating is an advocate against the current petitions and all of his opinions would either shorten the petition time or increase the number of signatures. Um, and that's fine, those are, those are fair. Uh, also, he's not a lawyer. Um, I am, and I try to stay neutral on these things. Uh, I'm not trying to help or support or, or hurt anyone, just trying to get, get this as, as right as we can. So um, I don't believe that there is confusion. I believe that for reasons of opposing the substance of the me measures, uh, a person is raising potential conflicts that don't exist. And I've tried to explain why they don't exist by going through the law. That's all I can do. Um, I got several over the Memorial Day weekend um, to, to look at, uh, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. But again, it's his right to advocate for his positions and, that, and that's what he's doing. Okay, we've got Mary and Aaron, and then I'm gonna jump in after Aaron. So Mary. So um, thank you for that, Tom. Um, uh, what I'm recognizing here is that um, there don't appear to be conflicts, but there do appear to be choices. So I think what we need to do is clarify or codify um, the choice so that it's always the same choice. And my, um, I would lean more towards an ordinance because we just previously had a whole discussion about providing flexibility in the charter. Um, and instead of codifying it in the charter, we could put it in an ordinance that could, if we need it to modify it, could be modified. Um, so that's my suggestion is to not put it on the ballot, but clarify it via an ordinance. Thank you, Mary. We've got Aaron and then me and then Adam. Yeah, well, if I can just ask uh, council, like, are, are we, what are we considering doing with this? Like, Tom, I appreciate the presentation. This, I agree with Mirabai, this is tough to sort through as a non-lawyer, but it, is anyone proposing that we reverse the guidance that staff has been giving this year? I haven't heard anyone say that, Aaron. Okay, great, because I would just want to get that clear, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So we're really talking about how do we want to make sure that there's 100% clarity for future years. Is that really what's in front of us? That's what I was bringing forward when I suggested this. It's about we don't want to have this discussion during the first year that we have electronic signature gathering. And we want great. to be crystal clear when we have that occur. Got it. Well, I, um, I, you know, Tom's recommendations and, and, and Mary's way of implementing them made sense to me. Thanks. Thank you. Um, 
So I'd be okay with an ordinance here. Um, I'm not sure one's needed, but I would appreciate the clarification of having it, you know, said out loud in a vote of council. You know, I believe that Tom is probably right <clears throat> in that um, the charter can take precedence. I'm not sure why it just doesn't take precedence by being the charter in the home rule city. Um, I think that would normally <clears throat> be where you would look for the rules of ordinances and charter changes um, that, that can be put on the ballot by petition. But if we did an ordinance, it would both be flexible and it would state specifically what we want to happen, which is the, the deadlines for referred ordinances, or people's ordinances and the deadline for charter changes are specified in the charter and our ordinance will say the, the city clerk should use the deadlines and the, the signature thresholds found in the charter. Um, and then we've said it twice, you know, we've said we got legal advice, legal advice said this, we made changes in 2018 to the charter to implement them. And we're gonna say in an ordinance, the clerk should use those changes that are in the charter. If there's a legal challenge, then I think the intent of the voters in the council is super clear about what we wanted for our deadlines and thresholds. If in fact, the state rule overrules what's in the charter, that would be a pretty heavy lift for somebody making that lawsuit. And if they win, it will be super clear what the rules are um, as to which applies. I think Tom's made a convincing argument that home rule allows us to set our election rules. And we just need to be super clear so that when there's the next transition of the clerk's office that council has said, this is a way the clerk should, should handle what's in the charter versus what's in the CRS. Adam. Thanks for that, Sam. That was, I think that summed up a whole lot really well. Um, I just wanted to give one more point to recognize that I, I do have major concern for one of the ballot initiatives, um, the charter amendment and ones specifically that they could run into the possibility of having a lawsuit on their hands and then all their work could be for naught. So um, I have a personal concern just that, you know, they might want to follow the, the worst case scenario for them because um, I would hate to see that happen. And that would suck a whole lot to try to gather all those signatures, especially in these times, and then have it all thrown away, essentially. So just wanted to bring up that last point. Okay, so I'm gonna interpret that, Adam, as we don't wanna change the rules for this election midstream. So the clerk has already given recommendations whether they would be what we would do if we were looking at this ahead of time or not is kind of a moot point because the, the petitioners were told something and I think we should stick to that, what they were told. And if they end up in a lawsuit afterwards, you know, that will be what it will be. But I don't think we should change the rules midstream for those petitioners. So, um, Tom, is that enough? Do you would you prefer yeah. an or I mean, would you oh, that, agree that, that ordinance is okay? Yeah, that's great, and I I, I think that's wonderful. Um, we'll get something drafted and get it get it scheduled for first reading as soon as possible. Okay, does council agree with that? If we go forward as Mary suggested with an ordinance clarifying this, uh, that what's in charter is what we're going to um, follow up. If there's anybody who doesn't like it, please speak up. Okay, very good. Then Tom, I think you've got unanimous direction to create an ordinance that explicitly states that the charter requirements, both in deadlines and in uh, signature thresholds are um, what the clerk is to follow. And then I've got Bob's hand. Yeah, I, I support this too. I, the only thing I would suggest is, is that because there's a, a timeliness to this and people are looking for direction, that we pass it on emergency rather than do a first reading and then two weeks later, a second reading when we just pass it on emergency next week and be done with it. Well, we're really thinking about having it applied to the next election. Correct. Oh, okay. Okay. So this, is all, this is all about next year as far as I'm concerned. Got it. Okay, well, I'm sorry. That's we, fine then. We need to take the time to, to sort of think about this. So since you have that time. Got it. Okay, thanks. So Bob had asked me one other question, and that is whether or not it's legal for the uh, 
for the mayoral election to be in an even numbered year. And there is a provision in the, the, the Colorado revised statute that sort of seems to say that municipal elections are always odd numbered years. That was added when some towns had elections in April that conflicted with uh, Tabor, which requires that all Tabor elections be in November. So they clarified that. Uh, again, the, the section that leads in Title 31, 31 102, that says that these, these rules apply to, except to the extent that your charter says something different. I believe that you could amend our charter to have the mayor directly elected in even numbered years. So I think that would be consistent with uh, state, with the, with the, the, as I view, home rule. Thanks for answering the question, Tom. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Very good. Um, so, Tom, it sounds like you've got enough direction on this particular one. Do any other council members have other issues that you'd like to bring up for this election? Okay, I see no one. So it looks like we're moving forward with three of them, if I followed correctly. The Arts Commission one is going to move forward. Um, the uh, Emergency powers is going to move forward, enumerating them, and then the um, ordinance that specifies that we're going to use the um, thresholds and the dates in the charter for our elections is going to move forward. So I count three. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Got it. We'll consider we'll consider that the summary. Um, Bob, your hand's still up, but I assume you said what you were going to say already. No, I have something new. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Just, I just want to observe, we, we talked about two ballot measures, which is fine. Um, I just want to um, remind everyone that there's a possibility of a third ballot measure, and that is if we um, strike an arrangement with XL Energy um, that includes a franchise agreement, that franchise would have to um, be, be voted on by the people. We don't know if that's going to be the case yet or not, but I just want to make sure that people have that on their radar, that that, that would be something that would be brought forward and potentially discussed in uh, July and August. Okay. Thank you, Bob. That's true. I'm just going to point out if it's okay to make a mild amendment that that would be the fourth issue because we're going to do arts, we're going to do emergency powers, we haven't decided yet, and then we're going to do the ordinance, which I guess we don't need to refer. You're right. I take it back. So we're taking three actions. One of them won't go to the ballot. And so you're right. The Excel could be the third one. Okay. Thank you for that. Sam, there's also, as you know, the possibility for council to choose to put a competing measure on if any, anything qualifies for the ballot. So we'll keep you apprised of that. And if council members want to consider what, what they might want to do, um, you can always do that. You can put a conflicting measure on yourself. Okay. Very good. Anything else on the subject, Rachel? Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention, I think we had discussed that um, we would be open to discussing with the um, petitioners, I don't know, was it July or August, whether we wanted to, um, if people don't get signatures, promote any of their issues to the ballot. I believe we, we kind of settled on leaving that open. So possibly up to four in addition. I didn't see support for that, but we can always bring it up later. Um, I, I thought we had had that discussion once before, but we can always bring it up again. I'll, I'll just mention that I think there there was uh, there there may have been majority support for that idea. I don't think we ever worked through that specifically. Okay. Well, why don't we wait and see where things end up before we yeah. pick that up? Okay, very good. Thank you for the presentation, um, Tom and Cheryl. And I think um, with that, Debbie, we're on to the next item. The next item tonight is the criminal justice update. All right. So I, I just want to introduce this very quickly. Uh, we have Judge Cook, uh, Sandra Giannis, and Chris Reynolds uh, to, will make the presentation. This is something we've been trying to schedule in front of council since, I believe, last summer. Uh, there's, there's some really exciting things going on in the municipal court about how we handle criminal justice issues. This is particularly important now since we have very limited resources in terms of actual incarceration. In fact, we don't have any. So uh, th these folks have been doing really great work. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Linda, I think, who's going to lead it off, and then Sandra and Chris. Linda? Thank you. I'm unmuted. Let me just see if I have... Yes, I can start my own video. Hello, everybody. 
Thank you for um, allowing us a little bit of time to speak here. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Chris, please. Um, I've been here on multiple occasions and um, usually in the context of quarterly updates. And I did one early this year talking about an overview of the municipal court, its role in city government, and some of our inform information about our work with defendants experiencing homelessness. But tonight, um, we really want to be able to highlight the great work that the prosecution staff is doing in partnership with the court and um, in the context of what the court is um, doing. So you can see here, these are the uh, key criminal justice system um, components that um, inform our work. Um, next slide, please. And to uh, take it down a level, these are some of the key individuals who are involved in the municipal court initiatives and their roles. Um, I have I can't say enough about having homeless navigators, um, and that has made our work so much more robust and given us so many more tools than we had previously. And this is a really unique model nationally, so I think it's something that um, we should all be proud of. Next slide, please. So this is an overview. Um, there's some years back I began recognizing that our offenders experiencing homelessness didn't have the capacity to access housing or in other ways improve their situations without someone to assist them in navigating the various hurdles involved in collecting documentation, applying for housing, even just experience, even just accessing some um, homeless services like medical care. So in early um, 2014, we added capacity to begin addressing that service gap. And I began using sentencing as a tool in a very small way to, um, to engage homeless defendants. We were able to ramp that up really for the first time in summer of 2015 when we had a, a law school intern who worked as our homeless navigator pilot. And that uh, really cleared the way for us to convert a probation um, position to a full-time homeless navigator position. And from there, everything is sort of ensued as you see from June um, of 2016 to uh, the present where we now have two full-time um, navigators. Thank you for going to the next slide, that's fine. <laughs> Um, when we added that um, navigation capacity, I began imposing sentences that I then suspended on the condition that somebody do something that was going to be helpful um, for them in this journey, whether it was applying for an ID card with um, the DMV office, a social security card, and so forth. There's a whole bunch of things that we can do. Um, so, the, so they're doing that. Um, item instead of actually doing the community service. So the, the offender is held accountable by doing one of these tasks. And if any of you um, has, I mean, we've all, we've all heard stories about the DMV, right? And how difficult it can be to navigate some of the bureaucracies there. If you could imagine on top of that being homeless and not having the right documentation and being rejected and so forth, these are not simple things that we're asking them to do. These are pretty arduous and are not, um, uh, are not, a, a light or, or an easy way off as opposed to doing community service. So um, having the uh, homeless navigator on board has really helped us um, in getting that done because now we have the people who can actually help people navigate those bureaucracies and um, assist them as they obtain these um, various things. And um, the homeless outreach team, I can't um, emphasize enough, is also a huge partner in this because they are often, as Officer Paddock likes to say, our black and white taxi. They're, they're involved in helping with the transportation piece, um, with finding the person um, out on the streets in their normal location um, so that we can keep that appointment at one of those offices and so forth. Next slide, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Sandra and then Chris. Good evening, Council. Sandra Yannis here. As you may know, the City Attorney's Office is comprised of a total of 15 attorneys and 12 support staff. I supervise an outstanding team of three City Prosecutors and one Legal Secretary. The City Prosecutor's Offices are located in the Justice Center. These City Attorneys have jurisdiction to prosecute any violations in the Boulder Municipal Code in Municipal Court. 
to my recollection, this is the first time that we have had the privilege of presenting you with information on the great work that is being done from a prosecutorial perspective and the great relationship of collaboration and respect that we share with the municipal court. We are delighted to be here. Prosecutors provide legal support to many departments and partner agencies, such as the Boulder Police Department, University of Colorado Police Department, Open Space Rangers, Code Enforcement, and Beverage Licensing Authority. Prosecutors provide regular briefing updates to officers on municipal violation matters, as well as officer training for new recruits. A portion of such as animal cases, code enforcement, or homeless issues. While all play an, an important role, Chris Reynolds is the lead attorney for matters relating to defendants experiencing homelessness. You will hear more from him about these connections, new relationships with community partners, and an, and an innovative pilot program he created involving warrant clustering. Next slide, please. All right, here we go. Sorry, I lost track here. <laughs> All right, so common types of municipal court cases. Um, some examples include um, parking, traffic, including photo red light, photo radar, animal violations uh, that include dog at large, aggressive animal, civil code violations such as the bear trash ordinance, short-term rentals, and um, sidewalk uh, clearing of snow violations. Um, we also have quality of life violations mostly committed by young adults, which would include minor in possession of alcohol or marijuana, um, consumption of alcohol in public, noise violations, nuisance party, fraudulent ID, and other quality of life violations mostly committed by individuals experiencing homelessness, such as trespass, camping, smoking in public, possession of alcohol or marijuana in public. And then, of course, we have various other misdemeanor offenses, such as brawling, harassment, and third-degree assault. All general offenses carry a maximum fine of $1,000 and or a maximum 90 days jail. There are three main groups of defendants that we generally see in municipal court. The first group are young adults, typically college students, who are usually first-time offenders. The second group are individuals experiencing homelessness, and the rest are generally people that have never had any interaction with the court system. Next slide, please. Our prosecution philosophy is to take a problem-solving approach. This approach can be described as a proactive cooperation between a prosecutor's office and, a commu and community representatives in an effort to target for prosecution those crimes and disorder issues that are of greatest concern to the community. Key elements of this approach is the use of partnerships with a wide variety of government agencies and community-based groups, and the use of various prevention, intervention, and enforcement methods. On a very basic level, this means the use of prosecutorial tools to address a person's underlying issues that result in criminal behavior, with the ultimate goal of helping the individual and thereby reducing crime. Traditional prosecution, on the other hand, does not involve significant consultation and collaboration with other government agencies and limits its use of tools to jail and or fines. While both problem solving and traditional prosecutorial models share the same goals of promoting fairness in the pursuit of justice, holding offenders accountable and ensuring public safety by reducing and preventing crimes, they achieve these goals using very different strategies. Even as far back as when I was a city prosecutor 18 years ago, we have offered students an opportunity to keep their criminal records clean by offering a resolution to their criminal case that involves restorative, <clears throat> excuse me, involves restorative justice. A typical plea offer for a first offense includes the opportunity to participate in the CU Restorative Justice Program. 
where the offender participates in a community meeting where volunteer community members are able to express how the offender's actions created a negative quality of life situation for their neighborhood with the goal of creating empathy, remorse, and understanding. There is also a component of the offender providing some type of community service and if appropriate, completing an alcohol class. If the individual completes these conditions and has no new similar offenses for a determined period of time, their charges get dismissed. The goal is to stop the bad behavior by using more effective tools. Another problem solving pr prosecution tool is the use of mediation, which is commonly used in resolving neighbor disputes. In terms of homeless defendants, for many years, we have been collaborating and supporting the efforts of the Boulder Municipal Court to better address the challenges of attaining successful long-term outcomes. In the spring of 2019, we took a more focused approach to handling violations that involved these individuals. Each prosecutor was assigned an area of focus, such as animal cases, code enforcement, or homeless offender issues. While they all play an important role, Chris Reynolds is the lead for matters relating to defendants experiencing homelessness. Since then, he has established community connections, forged alliances with community agencies to pool resources, collected data, and developed an innovative program involving warrant clustering. He has done an amazing job. I will now turn it over to Chris so he can explain these efforts in more detail. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Chris Reynolds. If we could uh, go to the next slide. So I've been a prosecutor with the City of Boulder for five years. That I was a judge advocate in the United States Marine Corps, where I was a prosecutor and a defense counsel. Tonight, I'm going to talk about prosecuting individuals experiencing homelessness. We represent a large percentage of the criminal cases that are filed in our court. We have many challenging problems, such as mental illness, addiction, and past trauma. Our philosophy in prosecuting individuals experiencing homelessness is to reduce their involvement in the criminal justice system and decrease recidivism. There are some core principles that underline this philosophy. They have community safety, collaboration, and harm reduction. Community safety means holding individuals accountable when they decide to hurt another person and adopt strategies to reduce the likelihood of further harm. Fortunately, most of the crime committed by individuals experiencing homelessness is a risk to public safety. More often, individuals experiencing homelessness are at risk of being victims of violent crime themselves and perpetrating violent crime. Collaboration means partnering with key stakeholders to develop and implement strategies to solve challenging problems. This includes collaborating with individuals who have the experience of homelessness. Harm reduction is accepting poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex-based discrimination, and other social inequalities affect both people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively addressing drug-related harm. Sometimes expecting somebody to completely change who they are can be unrealistic. Uh, next slide. So those are some general philosophies. And now what are the strategies that we use to implement these, this philosophy? In collaboration with the municipal court, we've developed relationships with organizations across Boulder County who are involved in some capacity with the homeless services system. The organizations include the Boulder County Sheriff's Office, Boulder County Housing and Human Services, Community Justice Services, Mental Health Partners, the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, the Bridge, the People's Clinic, First Presbyterian Church, the Boulder County Reentry Council, the Public Defender's Office, and the District Attorney's Office. Also, we use the power of plea bargaining to complement existing efforts to house high utilizers. High utilizers is a term that uh, is used in this context sometimes. And what a high utilizer is, is someone who has lots of contacts 
with the criminal justice system and is infrequently goes to jail or the emergency room or the detox center. And so that's what we're talking about when we say, when we use the term high utilizer. Also, we adapt to criminal justice reforms through uh, innovations such as warrant clustering, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I want to I want to briefly mention a couple of organizations that I that I spoke about. First is the Boulder County Reentry Council. It's a group of criminal justice professionals who are dedicated to serving individuals who are reentering our community from either the Boulder County Jail or the Department of Corrections, with the aim that they reenter the community. Uh, safely and they have the support that they need and they don't commit more crime. For the last year and a half, I have served on the steering committee of the Reentry Council. The focus of this group is the, the problem of the high utilizers. How do we stop the cycle of homelessness, jail, detox center, and emergency room? The second group that I want to mention is the First Presbyterian Church, which serves weekly meals to individuals experiencing homelessness through their Lamb's ministry. For the past year and a half, members of our office has been, have been volunteering on Thursday mornings, that's when they serve their breakfast, to cook breakfast and serve it to members of the homeless community. The Municipal Court Homeless Navigator and the People's Clinic also use this space for community engagement. The people who tirelessly work to put on these meals week after week represent some of our community's quiet heroes. They feel a critical need without asking for or receiving much credit for their amazing work. Serving in this capacity has taught me lessons in both the power of privilege and the importance of empathy for individuals struggling on the margins of society. A special thank you to Rob and Carol Wisselick for their uh, service at that important uh, event. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So we're, we're talking about strategies here and I want to touch on housing in particular. Now the graph that I'm showing you here is the effect of housing on uh, crime. 40 high utilizers received government assisted housing. And so this graph represents uh, those 40 high utilizers who were housed sometime prior to uh, 2019. And the blue line on the top is their number of munis municipal charges. And the green line on the bottom is the number of bookings at the Boulder County Jail. Other than being a high utilizer, so homeless in our community, lots of bookings at the jail, lots of charges, very diverse backgrounds. The only other thing this group has in common is they all received housing. You can see that in uh, after receiving housing in 2019, their interactions with the criminal justice system are dramatically decreased. Of this group of 40 high utilizers that have spent over 10,000 nights in the Boulder County Jail, not one of them was booked into the jail in 2019. People sometimes ask what housing has to do with criminal prosecution. Well, in the homeless context, Many low-level crimes are inexorably linked to a person's housing status. This doesn't mean that being homeless causes someone to commit crime or that crime occurs because the individual is homeless. Socioeconomic factors, trauma, and individual decision-making all play important parts in why someone becomes involved in the criminal justice system. Recognizing that both individuals and the system is complex and does not lend itself to one size fit, fits all solutions, housing is the only evidence based tool that has been found to reduce recidivism in the context of homeless related offenses. Essentially, what we have found is that when we get a chronically homeless individual housed and they retain that housing, their contacts with the criminal justice system are dramatically reduced, if not gone entirely. If we could go to the next slide. So that's kind of a higher, higher level view of housing in the high utilizer context. And I wanna talk just about um, one particular individual. I'm gonna uh, say that his name is John. That is not his real name, but I don't want to invade his privacy. Before our last homeless navigator, uh, Elizabeth Robinson left her position. She said to me, Chris, I wish that we could have done more for John. We never made any progress because the system is not set up to help somebody like John. 
Now, I, as a prosecutor, had known John for a couple of years from his frequent jail appearances. And to me, he was another homeless person in their mid-50s who never came to court. Ticket after ticket for either camping or trespass, never anything violent or threatening. And because he would never come to court, we would only ever see him at the jail when he was arrested on a failure to appear warrant. Every ticket or police report or body camera footage that I reviewed painted the picture of an individual by the ruthless winds of mental illness, homelessness, and trauma. Another thing that kind of set John apart was that he never had a bad attitude with the police officer. So he's always polite and accepted responsibility for his actions. When Elizabeth left, uh, we, we didn't have a homeless navigator for about six months, and that actually also coincided with when we didn't um, have an operational homeless outreach team. And so I told Elizabeth that I would be taking client management of 10 of her clients and that John would be my top priority. I came to learn a little bit more about John. He had been a su successful individual who had an international career that involved traveling to Los Angeles, London, Paris, and New York. It wasn't until a month after 9-11 when he was on a commercial flight, captain came over a loudspeaker to say the plane had to be diverted because of bad weather. This is the moment that everything changed for John. John thought that this meant that the plane was gonna get shot down. And so he grabbed a piece of paper and scribbled a confused note on it and passed it up to the pilot. It's being so close to the events of 9-11, people were on edge. And so they actually scrambled fighter jets and the plane was grounded and he was met on the tarmac by the National Guard and the FBI. Ever since that day, almost two decades ago, schizophrenia completely took over John's life and he bounced from mental institution and mental institution across the United States. And he ended up in Colorado sometime in the mid 2010s. While the jail has mental health staff who are dedicated professionals to serving their clients, the jail is an inherently difficult place to provide mental health care precisely because it's a correctional institution that is designed first to keep people safe. This first approach is at odds with the environment necessary to provide meaningful long-term mental health care. With the closing of uh, the mental health institutions that President Kennedy began and that uh, President uh, Reagan finished, this means that Many people like John who are in desperate need of help but don't have resources or the ability to access it in the community really only have the jail as their mental health care provider. We all knew that in order for John to have a chance at a happy and healthy life, while at the same time reducing his involvement with the criminal justice system, was to get him off the streets and into an apartment. After many meetings, presentations, emails, phone calls, consultations with mental health professionals, social workers, police officers, and court staff, we identified a housing resource suitable for someone in his situation. Mental health partners, the municipal court homeless navigators, and the Boulder Police Department's homeless outreach team worked tirelessly to get John inside. Then, almost a year after taking John from Elizabeth, I best news I've had since being uh, with the city of Boulder, that John got in and moved in and is off the streets. John's story highlights what is possible when a system adapts to meet people where they are rather than as we wish them to be. Next slide. So a little bit uh, larger perspective, John's story is just one individual. We actually, in the last year, uh, prosecuted seven high utilizers who were housed. Uh, and so those are, those are successes. Each brought unique challenges uh, that were no less difficult than the challenges that Don, John presented. We dismissed 131 criminal cases or also diverted, they mean the same thing, because of the positive steps that people took towards housing in the last year. We made dozens of referrals to mental health and substance use professionals and established working partnerships with agencies across the county. I believe uh, Judge Cook is now going to talk about some of the great work that the court's homeless navigators do to help individuals 
uh, navigate the complex housing process. And after Judge Cook talks about that, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about um, the pilot program that Sandra mentioned, the warrant clustering program. So if we could go to the next slide. Thank you, Chris, that was great. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because um, I have presented to city council with some information before. And um, I heard Kurt Bernhaber talk earlier about the, uh, the when he'll be coming back in July. And we're hoping, I'm hoping that um, we can weave some of um, our outcomes in with him so you can understand not only the big context of homelessness and who's been housed, but also the sort of subgroup of high utilizers that Chris is talking about. But um, for those of you who uh, didn't participate, there in, in mid-March, just as COVID was coming upon us, there was a um, tour set up for a group of people who were city council members as well as other um, officials and service providers to learn more about the um, homeless provider system in our city. And um, that, that was a, supposed to start at the municipal court. And in fact, it took place either virtually or at the municipal court, depending on where you were, and this slide is um, from that. But since um, our homeless navigator started working with us in June of 2016 until mid-March, um, this is uh, some quantification of what we've been able to achieve. So we've um, served over 222 unique individuals. They may have uh, accounted for many more state uh, municipal court cases than that, but that's how many unique individuals we um, served. And those are people that we served with anything more than what we call a light touch. These are people that we became pretty significantly involved with in terms of case management. Um, we don't have caseloads of 222 people. These are people who've been served over a period of several years. Um, but again, 222 unique individuals. Um, in serving them, we've been able to help obtain, or if they already had one, to collect in a place where it can be used, the following documentation. And the reason you see these documents, other than the other documents category, those five documents are the key pieces of documents that you need for somebody to be housed um, under our uh, various housing voucher programs. So um, 121 state IDs, 99 social security cards, you can see the numbers there for yourselves. Um, you may not know what a uh, disability verification is. This is not um, the type of disability that qualifies somebody to receive a social security disability income. It's a disability verification that says that they, it's, it's something sort of a lot less than that, but it um, says that they have a disability. Um, usually they're provided by a medical provider or a mental health provider. LOTH means a length of time homeless verification. So there needs to be documentation to show that they've been homeless for a sufficient amount of time to qualify for that housing resource. So those are what we've been able to collect in each one of those, um, behind each one of those um, documents that's obtained, there's a lot of work that's gone into place either by, um, certainly by the offender, but by the homeless navigator um, assisting them or helping them um, and sometimes for the birth certificates writing away for them. So there's a great deal of work and effort behind those numbers. But um, they're numbers that we're very proud of and that we had been asked to see if we could quantify. So that's um, where we stand with all of that. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Chris to talk about warrant clustering. Thank you, Judge Kitt. Um, so warrant clustering, uh, is essentially a diversion program. And it was designed in response to criminal justice reform legislation and the revolving door problem at the, at the jail. And when I say criminal justice reform legislation, what I'm talking about is uh, in April of last year, uh, the governor signed a bill that essentially me means that when someone is arrested on most municipal charges, uh, they are automatically going to be eligible for a personal recognizance bond. So even if they then fail to appear to court, uh, they can get out the first time they see a judge. And so 
while um, there's a lot of really great work going on, some criminal justice reform legislation has the effect of perhaps uh, increasing the frequency that people get arrested for low-level offenses. And so we don't want to start arresting more people. We want to focus our efforts on the people who are causing the most harm in the community and trying to solve those problems. And so what word clustering allows us to do is to uh, use arrests strategically to group cases together and address individual needs. If we could go to the next slide. So how, what we're really talking about is changing the way that failure to appear warrants or bench warrants or arrest warrants work. And so the way it used to work was someone would fail to appear on a summons, a judge would review the case for probable cause, and we have very good police officers in the city of Boulder, and so probable cause would be found 99.9% .9 of the time, and then a warrant would issue for their arrest. And this is whether or not it was a camping ticket, an open container ticket, a third degree assault, that's how FTA warrants used to work. And if we could go to the next slide. So what warrant clustering does is it adds an additional step to the warrant process where after uh, a morning docket, and a docket is just a date that people are supposed to come to court, a prosecutor will review all of the cases where someone failed to appear. And then, depending on the type of case and that person's criminal history, we will either ask the court to stay the warrant, meaning not issue the warrant, or we'll say, we want this case to go to warrant. And so that in essence is what uh, warrant, clustering, warrant clustering is, is that it's the um, kind of add some thoughtfulness into this process because maybe some somebody who gets a first time camping ticket doesn't need to get arrested if the, the officer who writes that person the ticket, if that's the only enforcement mechanism needed, to change the behavior. Most people who experience homelessness are able to get out of it within a few months. And so the, the work that the officers uh, do on the street is sometimes enough to get the message across that certain behaviors are illegal in the city of Boulder. If we could go to the next slide. So the preliminary results of the warrant clustering uh, diversion program are that we so far have uh, diverted or dismissed 308 criminal cases because they did not have a new violation after six months. During the period of the pilot, which was a 12 month period, we had a 42% reduction in jail bookings uh, with municipal charges. Uh, that we have uh, around uh, 730 municipal arrests per year. And during the period of the pilot, uh, we had uh, just, just over 400. We calculated that this uh, reduction in arrests and savings to the courts saved taxpayers $280,000. And important to the community safety piece is that we had additional officers on the street for 624 hours that they weren't booking people into the jail on municipal failure to appear warrants. If we could go to the next slide. So this is a graphical representation of uh, the effect of warrant clustering on the how many bookings we had per month at the Boulder County Jail. Top line, the top, uh, the blue part is the 10 year average. And so you can see that the warmer months, so June through October, we typically have an increased population of people getting arrested on, on uh, municipal charges at the jail, and then it kind of drops off during the colder months. And then the green portion below is uh, the results of warrant clustering. We were significantly below the 10 year average for each of the months. Now I'm not gonna say that just because we had fewer arrests means the program was successful. It's what fewer arrests mean. It means that the people who got arrested were the individuals who continued to commit uh, quality of life violations in our community or that they couldn't be safe in our community. And so the people who were getting arrested were the people who really should be in jail. And we can, could then, uh, because we had smaller jail dockets, 
we could concentrate resources on the people who were arrested and do things like release them to the custody of the homeless outreach team who could then take them to the social security office or uh, make it so that we'll dismiss their cases if they go and follow through with the housing process that they um, are so close to getting an apartment. And we were very successful in those efforts. And so it's not just that fewer arrests are in and of themselves a good thing. It's what we were able to do with the smaller jail dockets. And, and um, I think that if we could go to the next slide. And so in conclusion, I just want to say that our team is going to continue to build on the progress made and work with our partners in the city and the county to uh, address important problems that are facing our community. And um, I really appreciate your attention and time. And uh, I think the next, the next slide is the question slide. Well, very good. Thank you, Chris and Sandra and Judge Cook for the great background and the orientation to how, how our um, justice system is functioning these days relative to people experiencing homelessness. So I don't see any hands up for questions, but I would invite council members, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. Um, Judge Cook, is there a second part to this after um, this part, is there a review of crime stats? Um, yes, but that's be that's we're going to turn it over to Chief Harold for that purpose. That's what I was guessing. Okay, so I see two hands at this point. I see Mary and Aaron. Mary, go ahead. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you for all of this work. Um, it's amazing work and it just goes to show what um, some heads coming together and some ideas coming together can do to improve the lives of people using the criminal justice system and using um, the police. Um, and um, it's, it's heartening to me that um, one of the outcomes is that people are getting housed. And um, I, I really thank you all for your work and for your presentation tonight. Thank you. Okay, if anyone else would like to ask a question, if you'd raise your hand, Aaron, for some reason what? you're not up here, so. Yeah, I, um, well, I just wanted to, to add my thanks and accolades. Uh, that was an inspiring presentation and I really appreciate the innovative approach you're taking and sounds like it's being extremely successful. So thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, well, seeing no other questions, I guess I'll close and, and echo what Mary and Aaron said. This is really amazing work. It shows a great amount of human compassion to try and, and take folks, meet them where they are, and help them get the, you know, the fundamentals that most of us take for granted, like a birth certificate, a social security number, <clears throat> and you know, an ability to get to the DMV. Um, it's great that our systems are providing those opportunities for people. So thank you all for the work you're doing. It's much appreciated, and it seems like great work. And with that, um, Chief Harold, would you like to take the next section? Sure would. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide for me, please. So um, tonight, um, I'll be brief, but I'll be on point. Uh, what I'd like to cover is calls for service trends, um, and then especially the impact of the COVID-19 on those crime trends for January through uh, current. Um, I'll do a review uh, quickly of part one crimes, uh, and also I'll discuss a couple of uh, crime science principles that I think are very important for the community to understand, city leadership, and also uh, city council. I'll do a brief review of crash reports, and then I am going to um, talk briefly about some initiatives that I've started um, in my short time with Boulder PD. Next slide, please. 
Um, as you can see with this slide, um, Boulder PD receives approximately 82,000 calls per year. And what's interesting is that you could probably go back years from these, uh, from 2017, you'd see the same fluctuation, seasonal crime trends. Um, so this stays pretty consistent. It's highly predictable. And unless you have a pandemic, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Next slide, please. Um, PERF, which is the Police Executive Research Forum, has done a comprehensive study of the impacts of uh, COVID. Um, and every police department they have studied uh, have shown uh, quite a decrease in calls for uh, police service. Um, and this is coming out at the end of April of 2020. Next slide, please. Um, interestingly, um, Boulder receives about 6,500 calls per month um, on average in 2018 and 2019. Little fluctuation, but pretty consistent, about 6,500 calls for service. But next slide. If you look at the dramatic impact that um, COVID-19 has had on calls for service, they've declined by over 1,000 calls for service. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at the national headlines um, across the country, and this was also done by the Police Executive Research Forum, you really see that crime is uh, all over the place. Um, there's no, doesn't seem like there's a rhyme or reason for it, but it speaks volumes for one of the crime science principles that I wanna talk about later, about the opportunity structures that are very crime specific. And so if you look at some of our sister cities near us, like Denver, we tend to um, trending away from Denver where our violent crime is going down, but our property crime is going up. They're just the opposite in their major crime categories. So I really want to talk about opportunity structures, and I think this is a great way to visualize different cities across the United States are experiencing different problems because their opportunity structures um, are so widely different. Next slide, please. So in Boulder, we have approximately um, 3,900 part one crimes reported annually. And just as a reminder for everybody, part one crimes include homicide, robbery, aggravated assault, larceny thefts, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and rape. So part one crimes are your more serious crimes, and then there's part two crimes, which are usually quality to life issue type issues um, and disorder issues as well. So. Uh, Boulder Park one crimes per month, we average about 300. Next slide, please. So um, what we are seeing so far is that January through April, part one crimes, we've seen an increase of almost 15%. I would expect these um, crimes to start normalizing um, as more and more people um, are uh, visible to the community and businesses. So I expect this trend to uh, start to normalize within the next few months. Next slide, please. So I'd like to go through these specifically because I think they're important. So larceny and theft, um, approximately we received about 29.34 per year. Burglary, very low numbers, approximately 411 are reported annually. And then vehicle theft, um, again, very low numbers, approximately 283. So this is a property crime, part one crime. Next slide. As you can see, um, from January uh, to the end of April, um, we're seeing uh, increases in our property part one crimes. But I will caution everybody, um, these numbers are very small. Um, so I put the numbers, actual the actual uh, incident increases per each um, part one crime, property crime. So as you can see, burglaries are very concerning, but in May, we're starting to see those numbers um, slowly normalize. Next slide, please. So again, with the violent part one crimes, um, aggravated assault, um, we usually average about 186. Um, sexual assaults, we usually average about 41 approximately, and robberies approximately 39. Again, I caution everybody, these are very small numbers to analyze. Um, so next slide, please. 
So again, the numbers are at the bottom, so we can really understand this. Um, we see a 13.8% decrease in aggravated assaults. On sexual assaults, we are seeing approximately 10 fewer than we do. And on robberies, it's almost, even though we had this spike, it's almost, um, these numbers are so small that it's very hard to analyze. But these um, numbers are also normalizing and coming down to uh, three-year uh, averages, normal averages. Next slide, please. So this is probably the most important um, concept that I'll present tonight. Um, you know, uh, crime science, there's so much aggregated data for the past 40 years in crime that um, environmental criminologists or crime scientists have really um, fortified uh, the laws of crime. And this is something that's vitally important for police to understand, but also the community. And, and the, the, the concepts are, are pretty, pretty basic, but I can tell you no matter where you go across the United States or internationally, these crime science principles um, remain the same. And they are very simple. Crime is concentrated. It is not random. Crime clusters in particular places for very specific reasons reasons, and hotspots differ across crime types. And so what I'm going to do now, um, and I give great thanks to Dr. Lee Benson. Um, she helped me with the mapping on this, but I just want to demonstrate with Boulder's data, um, using a few years worth of data to, to visualize these crime science principles. Next slide, please. So this is a three-year robbery pattern um, from, I believe, the 27 to 19. And what this clearly demonstrates is that crime is concentrated across places, offenders, and victims. Um, for those of you um, in the audience that have studied finance, um, this principle is known as the Pareto's principle. Um, but in crime science, we call it the 80-20 principle. And basically, that says that very few uh, offenders, very few places, and very few victims contribute to the majority of our crime type problems. Next slide, please. And this is um, very interesting to me. There's a lot of discussion across the country about domestic violence uh, numbers going up or down. Um, I think this is consistent nationally that, um, as you can see, pre-COVID, March 16th to May 25th of 2019, you can see the clustering on the left side of the screen. During the COVID um, stay-at-home order, you can see that domestic violence uh, clearly is clustering um, at a higher rate and larger numbers exist. But if you look at the difference, um, you can just see these patterns clearly come out in the clustering and the concentration really demonstrates itself. And obviously this is because of the opportunity structure um, and the opportunities when people are cl uh, clustered closer together and the domestic violence, um, the clustering on this most certainly is impacted because, uh, due to multifamily housing in Boulder. Next slide, please. Here's some other examples of clustering throughout the cities. Um, this is on two-year crime pattern trends from May 2018 to May 2020. Um, as you can see, each of these different type crimes cluster differently in different locations. And the one that really jumps out at me is if you look at the difference between theft from vehicles and robberies, um, if you look at the robbery concentration on the lower right-hand side, it is completely different. There is no robberies in um, theft from vehicle um, mapping. And so it is very important that not only to understand the crime clusters, it's not random, but specific types of crime cluster together and similar types of crimes cluster together. So next slide, please. Uh, if you could hit it again for me, please. Whoops. I think I was missing. The crash reports um, are not showing, but I can just review those with you. Since COVID, um, crash reports have taken a dramatic uh, decrease. Um, and obviously, that's just because of uh, the no uh, vehicular traffic during some of those months. Next slide, please. 
So as I was talking about this crime clustering, I think it's so important um, for the police department to understand these um, very important crime science principles. So looking forward, um, I'm working with Dr. Lee Benson on developing a workload analysis. And what this will tell us is the difference between police officers' discretionary time versus the reactive time. And obviously any police department um, wants at, at least uh, 40%, um, hopefully more of discretionary time where the officer is not driven by calls for service as much as they have time to really look at problems like the judge was talking um, prior in really using a problem solving map model um, that really solves problems in that we're not just responding back and forth to different uh, calls for service. And this leads me into uh, the next important um, principle that I've been talking about through this presentation is that the police department has to develop a data-driven deployment strategy, and it has to be based on these crime science principles. It is the most important aspect of policing that I think a police department can engage in is developing a coherent strategy to deal with each particular crime, quality of life, and disorder issue that the, um, that the city is experiencing. So this is um, going to become more and more part of the police department's uh, fabric. And then lastly, um, what I've, I've already started is um, uh, beginning the agency to get ready for CLE accreditation. And this is a national accreditation agency that really comes in from the outside and takes a look at uh, the department's internal structure and um, really provides guidance if we are operating within model policies and strategies and deployment strategies. So those are just three of the initiatives that I've already begun um, since I started. It's all very important work because I think it speaks volumes to the effectiveness in the ethical police uh, work that uh, this department will be engaging in. And I do want to take the opportunity um, to just say what a service-driven agency Boulder PD is. Unlike in um, a larger urban environment, um, the statistics and the data that I'm looking at is really impressive as far as how much service this police department provides to um, the Boulder community that you wouldn't necessarily see in a bigger urban environment. So I just wanna give um, kudos to the men and women that work for the Boulder Police Department because they have been very impressive since I've been here. And again, thanks to Dr. Lee uh, Benson for her help with the mapping. And already she has developed um, really impressive uh, density, kernel density maps, uh, not only for me, but for my executive team. So that's the direction I'm heading in, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you, Chief Errol. <clears throat> that was a fantastic presentation. Um, you'll find that this council loves data, and so you're presenting all that good data about what's been changing as far as um, crime goes is really helpful and, and quite interesting. So we do have a few questions for you. I've got Mary and then Rachel. Mary? I don't think I had my hand raised. Well, it shows here, so. Oh, sorry. Uh, somebody didn't put it down, not your fault, actually. Um, Rachel? Rachel, I can't hear you, you're on mute. It's late, sorry. I don't have a question. I just wanted to uh, thank Chief Harold for that presentation and for um, directly diving into data. I was really um, kind of geeking out to the hotspots and <laughs> uh, heat maps that, that you put together. So um, I'm excited to, to see where you take this and I'm grateful that you're here. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks, Rachel, appreciate it. Great, anyone else questions or comments? Okay, I think that's mostly because it's late. Um, Mary, you have a hand up now. No, just real quickly, I wanted to um, echo um, Rachel's gratitude. Um, thank you very much for diving right in to getting her done. And um, as Sam said, we appreciate data and data-driven strategies and actions. So go forth and do good. Thank you. Thanks, Mary, appreciate it. Great. Okay. With that, I think we'll wrap up um, this section of our criminal justice update. Thank you all for um, your presentations and your, your answers to our questions. Very helpful. Um, and then uh, if we
we'd like to go on, Debbie, the next issue. Sure, we have the uh, next item is consideration of a motion to amend the council rules of procedure regarding the de declarations. And Tom, would you like to kick us off? Please, I have a presentation that will come up in a second. Uh, I wanted to thank Junie and Sam. They raised this issue. They noted in the council rules of procedure that the, uh, the rules relating to declarations were not really the policies that council were, uh, were following. So Sam asked me to do a quick draft of some potential rule changes that would uh, fix that. And I'm stalling to wait to see if I can get the PowerPoint to change the slides. Yeah, we have it up. Yeah, it's up. It just, Chris, it's not working for me. There you go. So the existing rules for declarations, mayor screens declarations. The mayor issues those with, with no substantial political issue. They're kept in a binder. Uh, the majority of the vote of council is necessary to call up a vote or, or on a resolution. At the proponent's request, the mayor may place a resolution on the council agenda. Next slide. Uh, so the proposed rule, new rule would be all proposed declarations would be placed on the CAC agenda. And the idea that is that council members would have an, an opportunity to review the agenda when it comes out on Friday and see if there's anything in which they're interested. Any council member could then ask the declaration to be issued by the entire council, read out loud at a meeting, or discussed by the entire council. Uh, CAC that would then decide how to proceed, when to schedule it, and that sort of thing. If no council member asks for further consideration, the mayor can go ahead and sign. All signed declarations will be posted on the city's website rather than in a binder. And we don't, there's a, in section 15E, there's a, there's a reference to proclamations. It's the only time that word is used in the, in the uh, council rules of procedure. So we're eliminating that word and just referring to everything as declarations. So I posted a draft change, next slide please. I posted a draft rule change uh, on the hotline and I would ask for council to consider a motion to approve amending the rules by uh, adding this and striking the word proclamation from section 15E. And that's my presentation. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Anyone have questions? Um, so just for a touch of background, um, the mayor signs proclamations that essentially just go into a binder virtually um, where there are things that never rise to the level of having council do a declaration or, or have people um, show up and receive um, the declaration we're putting out. And it, it's all at the <clears throat> um, discretion of the mayor, which is definitely not how we do things. You know, most of the declarations that we read are brought forward by one council member or another representing a community group. So this is just an attempt more or less to bring what's written down in our ordinances in line with what we're doing today. And, and Judy brought this up in the, because she wanted to have a proclamation issued. And so we went and looked and tried to figure out what the proclamation was and it wasn't defined at all. So that's why we ended up with declarations. So I don't see any questions. Are there any comments? Great. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Yeah, sure. I'll make a I'll make a motion. So um, I move that we um, change the council rules regarding declarations to the language proposed by the city attorney as um, shown on our screen tonight. Second. Okay, Judy second. So we have a motion and a second. You need discussion? Great. If anyone objects to this, this is a vote. Please let me know if you'd like to vote no on this. Seeing no one, it's a unanimous yes vote to um, amend the council rules. So thank you, Tom, for that. Appreciate it. Um, so I think that's everything we have on our agenda. I want to bring up one issue that was raised to me by Rachel, so I'll let Rachel speak about it, but it was about um, enforcement of our health orders. So Rachel, do you want to um, pick up on that? Sure. Um, so real quick, a, a 
about this time a week ago, we talked about um, Evan G. Fine and the um, uh, needing to maybe move from some education into enforcement, and it was discussed that that was going to go to the CAC um, and then come up for council discussion, and it didn't go to CAC, and um, so I'm just asking that we um, take it to CAC next week and bring it up for discussion so that we have thought through this methodically before we um, go on break. Great, so that's a request that CAC um, do what exactly? So could you define a little better, say we were to put something on the agenda, what would the title be and um, would it be a motion? Would it be direction to staff? What are you, what are you leaning towards? I think it would be a discussion of enforcement of COVID related health orders. And this would be direction And again, to staff. that's just, that's what we had committed to last week. We ended it with, we're going to come back to um, have a discussion on enforcement. We also said that staff was not gonna wait on our discussion to um, make necessary changes. But um, my understanding was that we agreed to, to discuss whether um, we were going to change from a more uh, educational approach to COVID health orders to some enforcement. Bob, did I see your hand up? You, uh, you asked the question I was gonna ask, thanks. Okay. Uh, did I clarify it enough? And, I think as much as anything, I'm just reminding us that we we agreed to do that and then we didn't do it. Yeah, and I'll just say what I said to Rachel when she first brought this up. Um, I think the perception was that we had taken a bunch of actions around the Ebb and G Fine thing because we had the closure of the creek and so on. Um, it sounds like the issue is bigger than what got dealt with by staff last week. So it sounds to me, Rachel, I'm gonna try and interpret this so we can have the right discussion at CAC. It sounds to me like this is more policy direction than an ordinance or some other kind of rule change. It's more about asking staff to lean more heavily on enforcement than education around health orders, masks and or, social or distancing. Discussing whether we want to do that, given that um, I think we can anticipate with loosening of orders and more people going out about that there may be um, more issues and, you know, the uh, congregating at places like MG Fine will probably move somewhere else. So how do we want to respond to that um, as we gear up for the summer? Okay, so I guess uh, what I would ask for, we have all council here and this is being discussed. Generally, do most people agree that we should have this discussion and you'd like CAC to schedule it as a matter, say under the city manager? So let me see thumbs up. So I see three thumbs up. So I see Mark, let me make sure I got it. Mark, Rachel and Adam, for thumbs up on that. So would some of you and Aaron, okay, so that's four. Um, I guess I'm going to say yes, and I think we should schedule it. I think um, we should put it on under matters uh, for the city manager to get guidance from council on enforcement. Um, we can figure out to see to see how long we think that's going to take and what will specifically be there. And I see Mary has her hand up. Yeah, I, I just have a question. This seems like a really broad topic. Um, and uh, and that's why I didn't uh, raise my hand. It seems like overly broad. It seems like it should be f a little more focused um, about the, the locations, the type of enforcement, the um, education versus enforcement. Is it that at the trailheads? Is it by the creek? Is it... Um, or is it as broad as if you're walking down the street not wearing your mask, you're gonna nail somebody? I mean, what, I, I don't, it's overly broad to me. And um, are we trying to address a problem here or are we, it, it seems that the discussion to me, as I recall the discussion last week, it was um, we need to address Eben Fine. Um, it was addressed that was closed and that seemed to um, address that particular um, concern. Is there another one that we have at hand or are we, 
I, it just seems overly broad to me. So if there were more specificity around it, I may be able to support that. But I guess we're putting it on the agenda. So um, if in the interim there could be some thinking around the specificity, it just seems really overly broad to me. Mm -hmm. And so let's keep going, Aaron. I got you next. Yeah, well, what, what I remember from last week is that uh, Evan G. Fine was the, the biggest issue, but I think there was an interest that, that I remember hearing expressed by counsel to say, well, we, we need to take a little bit more of an enforcement-based approach and because there's also the parties on the Hill and you know, maybe some other things. And so we, we said, please work on that and then let's discuss it next week. And the uh, Evan G. Fine got closed, which I think was a great move. Um, you know, but I think we did bring it up in a larger context. And so what, what maybe what we could uh, have as a discussion is if city staff wanted to come to us and uh, tell us what they're currently kind of thinking and planning, you know, about how to deal with um, issues as they come up, and then maybe we could give some feedback on that and kind of maybe specifically around, you know, gatherings that don't have social distancing. So it's just one possible approach to it. I've got Bob and Mark. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with Mary. I'm still a little bit confused what the question is. If it's what Aaron just said, which is a presentation by staff about what they're doing, I, that's fine. It's always interesting to know what uh, what staff is doing, just like we've we've heard this just just this evening. But the question I think I heard was, um, are we going to do more enforcement? And I guess I'm going to ask the, you know, ask the hypothetical question. What if staff comes back next week or whenever we schedule this and says, no, we're not going to do more enforcement. They'll have good reasons for it. Like we have a limited number of police officers or the jails are closed or whatever. Um, so if the answer is no, is that a satisfactory answer or are people looking for a yes? If people are looking for a yes, I guess it would be helpful to have a specific request as opposed to, are you going to do more enforcement? Um, so I'm, I'm with Mary. I'm struggling a little bit about what staff is meant to put together by way of presentation and what answers people are looking for. So might I make a suggestion here? And Mark, I'm not trying to cut you off. We'll come back to you in a moment. But might I make a suggestion that we put a placeholder at CAC for Monday and we ask for Rachel and or Aaron, anyone else who's interested, to send a note to hotline that says specifically what they're interested in, because I agree with Mary, it is general and generic. I was going to propose that we start with the reason I suggested that we put it under city manager was start with Jane and have her talk about, you know, the approach to enforcement, any changes that have been made um, based on Evan G. Fine and, and parties on the Hill, and then go from there, because I think that would help us do what you're talking about, Mary, which is define where are the problems and define what are the problems. Um, I, I guess it's kind of like what Bob was saying as well, in the sense that we start with staff, we hear what staff is doing, we know the subject is enforcement versus education, particularly gatherings are of high concern, and then we can give feedback to staff. So this is more, of, that's why I put it under matters in my head, because it's not, there's no ordinance involved, and it's just feedback from council to staff. I would assume that's half an hour or 45 minutes. Um, and so what do people think about having the people who want to have this heard tell us exactly what they're thinking? Um, Mark, you're up, and then um, I'll listen to anybody else who wants to talk about how to frame it up. Yeah, my recollection as to how we were going to move forward on this was similar to Aaron's. I, I think there was a sense that we were going to revisit it um, I don't think we defined it last time. I don't think we've defined it tonight, but I think there was a generalized interest in uh, having a conversation about the balance between enforcement and education. I'm fine with, with uh, Bob's suggestion in, in terms of how to proceed and, and, and kind of bubble this thing up and, and uh, take another look at it. Okay. I think. CAC has enough to be able to put something on and make a guess at what we're going to talk about and how to frame it up. But I would also suggest that if what council members have heard tonight about the way we might put this on the agenda and talk about it isn't clear enough for them, um, feel free to write a note to CAC or the hotline about what you'd like to see. 
I think other... I start CAC this week. Can I just bring my thoughts there or do I have to put it on hotline? It's up to you. Um, the only reason to put something out ahead of time is it gives me and Bob time to think about it as well. So just a little bit less reactive. And, but either and, way is fine. And more, more importantly, staff, they have to do the work. All right. Okay. So I think we have a to-do for CAC from council to at least clear this up a bit. So I'm gonna assume we're gonna talk about it at CAC. If other council members have further guidance about what you would like or not like to see, let us know. Great, any other subjects we should touch on? Super, well then I guess we'll declare this meeting of the Boulder City Council adjourned at 1113. Thank you all. Have a good night. Live from Paris, I'm Paul Blankat.